The Planning and Zoning meeting for August 21st, 2019 will now come to order. Please stand with us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we have roll call, please? Chairman Williams? Here. Vice Chairman Severs? Here. Secretary Chambers? Member Spidell? Here. Member Baker? Here. Member Richardson? Here. Member Hare? Okay, and we have quorum. Next is approval of minutes for July 17, 2019, and there was some corrections sent out. Um, is there any corrections or motion, motion to approve? I move to approve with the corrections. Is there a second? I second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Any, all persons who anticipate speaking on any public hearing item must first out, fill out the oath card contained, <clears throat> be heard on the agenda item, and signed the oath card contained thereon. These cards are located on the table near the entrance to council chambers or may be obtained from the recording secretary. This meeting will be conducted in accordance to procedures adopted in Resolution 24. Dash 1997. Those speaking in favor of a re request will be heard first. Those opposed will be heard second. And those who wish to make a public com comment on an item will speak third. The applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. A representative from either side, for or against, may cross examine a witness. Anyone who speaks is considered a witness. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents you desire the commission to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the city. Please submit such exhibits to the recording secretary. Staff, has all items been properly advertised? Yes. And has anybody had the opportunity to speak to anybody in the public about the items coming before us? Okay, and I did. Uh, Mr. Severs, uh, if you wanna go first. Uh, yes, sir. On item number uh, 9A, I spoke with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Emmett Larson, their son, Eric, operates that facility. I spoke to them on Sunday. Uh, their son called me uh, Sunday afternoon, had questions about uh, what uses were allowed. It was my understanding he was going to have a meeting with staff on, uh, on Monday, and uh, we did not discuss the merits of the application one way or the other as such. Um, I did... Uh, communicate uh, on item C and D. I do not believe those are quasi-judicial matter. They're legislative in nature. But there were some individuals who attended a tree workshop that were interested in um, the Berkshire subdivision that came up during the tree workshop. And uh, I made them aware that this item was on the agenda. There was no conversation, discussion about C or D. Uh, I think it would be helpful if these were broken out as to what is quasi-judicial and what is legislative since we're, your request is a blanket. <laughs> yes. And, and there are different rules. Uh, I think the attorney can clarify that for us. The rezoning is treated as a quasi-judicial excuse me, decision, whereas the comprehensive plan amendment is treated legislatively. Is that it? Okay. I can go into a bit further when that item comes up, unless you'd like me to elaborate at this time. I, mean, I think we're good. But so, and I had a conversation um, regarding small scale amendment 2 2019. I had discussions, multiple discussions with city staff. I had discussion with uh, Melbourne Planning Department. And I also had a discussion with St. John's Water Management District. Um, although um, I got additional information, um, I'm open. I haven't made up my mind either way on this, so um, I'm here to, here to listen. So with that, um, I guess we will go to the first uh, 
agenda item. The first agenda item before you tonight is uh, 9A. That's uh, rezoning for a property uh, with a business titled Whole Nine Yards, rezoning number 2-2019. And that starts on page 11 of your packet. So this is a public hearing to adopt an ordinance amending the, the zoning map to allow this property to be rezoned from the M1 Light Industrial Services and Warehousing Zoning District to the Community Commercial Zoning District. The property is about, it's just a little bit more than a, than a half acre. Uh, it's located at 486 North Washington Avenue. The applicant, Honeycutt and Associates, on behalf of the property owner, Itani Properties, is requested to amend the existing zoning designation on property totally uh, just above half an acre at this uh, 486 North Washington, which is located on the south side of North Washington Avenue between Elaine Drive and North DeLeon Avenue. While the current light industrial services and warehousing M1 zoning district is consistent with the downtown mixed use future land use category that's currently on the property, the requested rezoning to the community commercial zoning district may be preferable along a major corridor into the city. The rezoning is being requested to permit the sale of vehicles in addition to the vehicle repairs that are and service that is currently conducted on the site. On page 13 of your packet, you'll see an aerial of the property. Page 14 of the packet starts the staff report, and I'll briefly go through it. On page 15, I've described the, the current land use and zoning and the surrounding uses. Uh, the property is currently used as the garage and auto body and auto paint shop. There's, again, the downtown mixed-use land use on the property, and it has an M1, which is a light industrial zoning district on this property. They are proposing to maintain the current auto sales, I'm sorry, garage and auto body and auto paint business, but also in addition to that, add auto sales, which is currently not allowed in the light industrial zoning district. It is allowed, both uses are allowed in the community commercial zoning district. So that's why the applicant is requesting for this rezoning. North of the property, all the properties on the north, south, east, and west are all in the downtown mixed use land use category. The zoning on the north of this property across the street has, also has community commercial M1, which is light industrial. And also there's an area there that has an RMH2, which is a residential manufactured housing park. South of this property has also uh, an M1, light industrial zoning. East of this property has a community commercial zoning, and just west of it is zoned office professional, which is a very low intense type zoning district. On page 16, I'll briefly go summarize the history of this project property, uh, which is in it's page 16 on your, uh, of your packet. The property has approximately 150 feet of frontage along US Highway 1 or North Washington Avenue. Um, according to the city's records, a building permit was issued for a garage on the site property, for, on the subject property in 1974. For some period between 1962 and 74, the property was zoned single family residential. Although staff was unable to locate records to confirm the date and rationale for this designation, subsequent to the issuance of the building permit for the garage, which was issued in 1974 in error, the property was rezoned to commercial in 1975 by ordinance 3 1975. There are currently several buildings on the site, including a 4,800 square foot metal building, a 1,200 square foot building, and several smaller buildings at the rear of the main building. We did do some, subsequent to our publication of this agenda, we did do additional research at the request of the applicant. And we found that two of the buildings were permitted. However, we could not find permits for uh, carports or sheds, if you will, that are on the property. There are two that are located at the back of the building, and I'll refer you back to the aerial on page 13 of your packet. You'll see that there are two per, uh, sheds there in the back, and there's some more additional sheds on the west side there. Um, so back on page 16 of your packet. In 1957, the property was zoned B1, high class business district retail. In 1962, the property was rezoned to C1, drive-in car service, service station, ice cream, and dispensaries. In 1975, the property was, was rezoned to R1B single family, or from the R1B single family to the BA business. Staff could not find any record relating to the rezoning from C1 to R1B in the years between 62 and 75. 
1993, as part of the citywide administrative rezoning, the property was rezoned to M1, which is currently the zoning on the property. So the current request is to rezone it down, down zone it to city CC, community commercial. Starting on page 17 and the subsequent, subsequent pages are our responses to several criteria that we have to respond to that are in the code as far as consistency with the comprehensive plan. We found that the rezoning request is consistent with the comprehensive plan. On page 22 of your packet starts additional land development regulations requirements for zoning districts consistent with the downtown mixed use land use. I, excuse me, I skipped over an area here. Okay. On page 21 of your packet, excuse me, at the top of the page and then starts the criteria related to zoning. We found uh, the purpose of this rezoning is to allow vehicle sales to be conducted at the site. The current M1 zoning district does not permit the use. And it should be noted that vehicle sales are currently being conducted on the property immediately to the east of the site. One thing I want to note to you is that if they, the rezoning is approved and that they do uh, ask for a business license or, or what we call a business tax receipt to allow for the sale of vehicles on the property, that at the minimum they will be required to submit a site permit, whether we call that a class one or class two. Either way, there will be a site permit required in order to identify the location of where autos will be uh, stored for sale and displayed. And so that might require some additional improvements that have to meet the code, such as landscaping requirements, uh, new parking requirements, and such. So uh, rezoning this property does not automatically allow you to go ahead and have the sale of vehicles on the property. There are other requirements in addition to that that are administrative. On page 22, on number seven there, I'm just gonna uh, summarize the other uh, substantial reasons why the property cannot be used in the existing zoning district. Again, the M1 light industrial zoning district does not allow auto sales. We've also identified that there might be a requirement for 24 parking spaces, so that will include what they have there now, and if there's a requirement for additional spaces, that would have to be uh, dealt with through a site permit process. There are special conditions of, this, of the downtown mixed-use land use category. So in this case, we have a downtown mixed-use land use category on this property, but a zoning that is not downtown. The zoning is M1 going to be CC if approved, thereby the code says that the land use operates as an overlay and there are additional uh, zoning standards in there. So on page, at the bottom of page 22 of your packet, I've uh, identified those uh, criteria. Addition, it's I titled additional land development regulation requirements for zoning districts consistent with downtown mixed use land use. So in section 28.7-7A of the code states, in addition to the applicable requirements contained elsewhere in these regulations, zoning regulations, all property developed after the date of adoption of the zoned single family district, multifamily, T, and so on, community commercial, and even the M1, um, as shown on the adopted future land use map, shall comply with the following additional requirements. So on the next page, on page 23 of your packet, The C states there on the top there on subparagraph one, the community commercial, CC, and the light industrial, M1. The property has to have frontage on ac and access only from a collector or higher road, which it does. Or property has frontage on, on other streets here. And so we state that the subject property abuts North Washington Avenue, which is classified as an arterial. It also has criteria about ground signs, which will be dealt with later during a site permit process. Fences or walls, We're not, the applicant is not proposing any kind of development to us right now. They do not have a concept to submit to us for any redevelopment of this property. <clears throat> if all required parking, street, all street parking can otherwise be accommodated on site, the required front and street side setbacks can be substituted with a minimum 10 foot deep landscaped buffer area. That's subparagraph four here. The reason I bring that up is because our current code requires all redevelopments or new development to have a 20 foot landscape yard 
along any public right of way. However, in this downtown mixed use overlay, if you will, uh, this a new development or redevelopment can uh, have a, a lesser uh, landscape buffer along, or strip along that right of way, provided um, they can put all of their required parking on the site. Again, I do not have a concept from the applicant as to what they're going to do on this property, but that will be dealt with during the site plan permit process. On the next page, page 24 of your packet, I'll, I'll read subparagraph 7. Outdoor storage is permitted in the rear and interior side area, provided this area is enclosed with a six-foot-high opaque screen and no items so stored are visible over the enclosure opaque screen. That does not apply to the sale of vehicles. Vehicles can be displayed out front of a building, just like any kind of car dealership, but they have to meet certain development standards. And so on page 24 of the packet, we recommend approval of the, of the request. However, um, I did receive a call today from the applicant, Mr. Rodney Honeycutt, that they did not uh, conduct a public community meeting. And so based on that, uh, we do not have a complete application thereby. Therefore, so we would request that this application be continued or the, to the next meeting. So we don't have an objection to the public hearing being open and, and for evidence be dis for the application to be discussed, but we would ask for it to be continued and reopened again at the next meeting, thereby giving the applicant additional time to conduct that community meeting. So on the next pages, we included the maps uh, the future land use map, flood map, uh, soils map. We also have a wetlands map. We do not find any issues. And the zoning map. And then on page 31 of your packet, you'll see a survey of the property. The ordinance for the rezoning starts on page 32 of your packet. And the application is also included from the applicant. We also conducted a concurrency review, which is a preliminary concurrency review. A formal final concurrency review is completed during site development permit reviews. So what we have on page 37 of your packet is a preliminary concurrency review. We did not find any issues <coughs> with this. And this is addressing whether there is enough capacity of our water, <coughs> sewer, um, roadways, and parks to accommodate new development. We do not have anything proposed at this point. With that, I'll try and answer any questions you have. Um, I was kind of surprised that he didn't just request a uh, for us to table, since that seems to be our option, our only option. Uh, Mr. I believe Mr. Rick Kern is here to answer any questions you have about this, but it's the discretion of the commission if you would like to hear the applicant or if you'd like to continue it to the next meeting. Um, well, let's, let's uh, open, I mean, since we've heard the items, we might as well open it up to the public. So, if you, did you fill out a, uh, a card? All right. So, um, uh, yeah, but if you'll hold on, because I have somebody else coming up, so thank you. Hi, uh, Richard Kern, uh, business address 3700 South Washington with Honeycutt Associates. Uh, we've reviewed the staff report. We concur with their findings. Uh, as, as noted, we, we, are, we are requesting the board to um, table this because of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the public meeting. Public meeting uh, had, had not been uh, uh, conducted yet. Um, there was one thing that came up that uh, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if the board can include this or not, but um, some of the existing buildings or sheds on the, on the back side of the property um, are not outside the uh, um, uh, setbacks that are, that are required. So I don't know if the, if the rezoning can be approved, um, uh, allowing um, non-conforming uses or, or uh, uh, non-conforming setbacks on, on the uh, on the property or not that 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 probably be a a a a, a, a item for the uh, city attorney's office to address so. okay uh, any questions see none thank you all right um you come up thank 
you. I'm Joshua Ottenruth. I'm one of the managers at Whole Nine Yards Automotive that the, uh, the rezoning application, I've been helping through this process throughout, um, and I wanted to piggyback on Mr. Kern's comments. Uh, we had, did have an opportunity to have a preliminary meeting with, uh, with in the rezoning department with Brad, and uh, one of the things that was brought to our attention was the uh, setback parameters to how they would change from an M1 to a CC uh, rezoning and whether that would affect. And, and obviously, we have done some things um, from a planning perspective uh, for the approval once that approval is, is granted. Uh, to adhere to anything that, that the council would ask of us as, as far as improvements. Uh, certainly we are a small business and we'd like to continue to grow our business within the Titusville community. Uh, we feel that we can be uh, a long-standing business for the community to depend on and to work with. And we appreciate your consideration in our rezoning application uh, and we're willing to do what's necessary. As Mr. Kern had said, we do have to adhere to the code, so we do have to have that meeting, which we have scheduled. Um, and if it's, if it's within your good graces, we'd like to be able to come back and be heard again once all the things are compliant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, so I have a question of staff real quick. Um, did, is it your, before we close it, um, is it your thought that a variance on this, or since the setbacks will change, what are, what is the solution to the sheds? Well, we could continue looking at our records to see if we can find permits. We just um, this was the request from the applicant was only a few days ago. Um, however, if we can't, f if if the, it has to be addressed in some way, if they're with a permit, um, they would have to submit to us an after the fact permit. And the issue is farther is whether a variance is required or not, we can address at that point. Okay. All right, so we will close this item to the public, bring it back for the board. Is there questions of staff? Was, that was the only cards, correct? Okay. Um, Mr. Sievers. At uh, the city staff's recommendation and the applicant's request, I moved to table until the next meeting. Is that when you want it? That would be September 4th before, um, yes, sir. Okay, September 4th. Second. Okay, can we take a vote on this, please? Member Baker? Yes. Member Spidell? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Vice Chairman Sievers? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. All right, so items tabled for next, till the next meeting, so it looks like we will have an agenda after all for the next meeting, right? We just got one. So. <laughs> Maybe we can still coincide the workshop somehow in there, you know, even if it's one item. <laughs> All right, next item, please. Okay, so the next item is item number 9B. That begins on page 39 of your packet. This is a small scale amendment or a comprehensive, this is an amendment to the city's current comprehensive plan, future land use map. Uh, it's a small scale amendment, so the property is, that is being, uh, whose land use is being changed is less than 10 acres. Uh, the property is located at 2001 South Street, also identified as parcel 514 by the property appraiser's records. This is a public hearing for this property to be, have the land use changed and also the rezoning would be changed as well. So it'd be two different actions on those are two different recommendations. Um, it's a little complicated. The property has several land uses and several zoning districts and the applicant is asking for them, some of them to be revised or the boundaries to be changed and some to be eliminated altogether. Um, and I'll explain by reference to a map which I'll refer to. The applicant is requesting this small scale comprehensive plan amendment with rezoning to allow the construction of a multifamily dwellings on the property located at 2001 South Street. Again, we do not have, um, or in this case, we do not have a concept plan. This was just stated by the applicant as their future intent. The property lies on the south side of South Street, west of the North Area Community Education or Whispering Hills facility. Of the approximately 11, just under 12 acre parcel, approximately seven, just, just under eight acres, are the subject of this request. 
the property is currently des designated with conservation, downtown mixed use, low density residential, and high density, density residential land uses. And op the property also has the open space and recreation OR zoning district, a multifamily high density R3 zoning district, and a single family medium density R1B single, uh, single family zoning districts. The intent of this request is to correct the conservation open space and recreation OR designation. I'm sorry, to, to correct the conservation land use and the OR zoning district on the wetlands on site and designate the remainder of the property as downtown mixed use and high density residential land uses and multifamily high density R3 zoning. The maximum number of multifamily units that could be achieved after the, uh, this is approved is 99 based on the R3 density of 15 units per acre. Staff recommends approval of the requested small scale amendment and rezoning with the condition that the project in the future connect to the city sewer when it is developed. On page 41 if your packet starts the staff report but I'm going to skip ahead to a map to give you an orientation first before I go into an analysis of the description here. So on page 54 of your packet, you'll see the aerial. And then page 55 of your packet, you'll see the land use map. You can see on the left side, on page 55 of your packet, the land use map. That's the existing future land uses. You can see in the blue there, that's the downtown mixed use land use. You can see everything in green, that's the conservation land use. And then everything else has that high density residential. And there's a sliver of this property that has a low density residential in gray. If, you have any, if you're confused by what I described, please tell me. <laughs> on the map on the right, on page 55 of your packet, you'll see the new configuration of the land uses after this is approved. This would be based on a wetlands delineation and environmental study that was provided to us. We did receive concern from a uh, commissioner about this because of the date of the information. Um, I will say though that we did respond that we couldn't find requirement in the code telling us that we have to have something specifically as recent as what uh, St. John's would require. And so we, would, we entertain any kind of request or recommendation from you as to the action of whether you, this is acceptable or not for this particular application or, and or if you would recommend maybe asking the city council to, to consider amending the code to make it more specific about this requirement. On page 56 of your packet, you'll see the zoning map. So you'll see the three zoning districts on the property on the existing zoning. R3, multifamily, R1B, single family, and OR, open space. And then the map on the right it would be the new configuration of the zoning districts after approval. The reason why you see this is because the code and the comprehensive plan currently require that conservation must be on, put on property where there is wetland found to be five acres or more. And that the boundaries of the conservation land use can be adjusted based on the ground truth and information, which is the wetland delineation that we received. So the result would be this map on the right here. And then the applicant would have the intent to utilize the area that has the R3 zoning for the development. You can see on page 57 of your packet, the wetlands map. So that area that's in green would be considered the area of the wetlands. And on page 58 starts the preliminary um, environmental assessment that is dated 2005. Now I'm going to jump back to page 41 of your packet and summarize the staff report. I, yes. Is there an yes. updated environmental report or is it just the 2005? That's it. That's what we have, sir. We do Pardon? not have anything more updated than that. Okay. And the wetland delineation map that we received, the survey was dated 2006. Um, Starting on page 41 of your packet, I'll 
briefly describe what's being requested here. Um, this begins the staff report. This is being requested by Mr. Robin Fisher. Um, on page 42 of your packet, I'll briefly describe the land uses surrounding. The property to the north and across the street has a downtown mixed use, conservation, and low density residential, and a general use zoning district. Property immediately to the south, which has some single family homes there, um, is has a conservation land use and a medium density residential land use. And then the zoning in that area is open space and recreation, OR, and has a single family R1B sing, uh, zoning district. The property immediately to the east and to the west have a public zoning, but different land uses. The property immediately to the west has a conservation land use. On page 43 of your packet, we provided a little bit of history about this property. The applicant is requesting a small scale amendment and rezoning in order to allow multifamily development. Subject property is, loca is located on west of the Whispering Hills facility. The land use history, in 1966, the subject property was designated as apartments. On July of 1981, the land use plan was updated by ordinance 38-1981, which changed the designation on the subject properties from apartments to residential. With the adoption of the 1988 comprehensive plan, which was mandate mandated by the Growth Management Act, the properties remained within the residential land use category. In 1988, the property was designated conservation and residential in the same configuration as you see it today. In 1992, the current downtown mixed use land use was added. I believe that's incorrect. That should be 2010 when that land use was actually added on there. In 2009, the City Council adopted a comprehensive plan amendment which removed the former residential land use designation and applied the high density residential, medium density residential, and low density residential to numerous properties between Cheney Highway and Northern City limits. Based on a staff report uh, in 2009, the amendments to the future land use map of the comprehensive plan were initiated to reflect the existing and anticipated growth within the city. However, it appears that land use changes were based on existing zoning map. Those properties within the R1C zoning district received medium density residential land use, and those properties within the R3 zoning district were designated with a high density residential land use when the amendment was adopted in 2009. As the property subject of this current small scale amendment request were within the R3 zoning district, at the time of adoption of the 2009 comprehensive plan amendment, the high density residential land use was applied based on the zoning map. So as you can see, there was a lot of um, confusion from when our research as to how, why this property has so many different land uses configured on it and so many different zoning districts. I won't go into the uh, zoning history. It's space, it reflects, it's similar to the land use uh, application history. So beginning on page 44 of your packet, um, we address the requirements that are in the code as far as uh, the co consistency with the comprehensive plan. We believe it meet, it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, on page 49 of your packet, I think, uh, we addressed these rezoning criteria from the code, including whether there are public facilities available transportation impact, solid waste. We believe that if this, based on the maximum density of this project, it probably, of this property, it could generate 653 average daily trips, which would require a traffic study with any new development, if it's gonna be proposed at that maximum density, of course. Um, we do have uh, facilities available to serve this property if it is developed, including solid waste. On page 50, of your packet, the density or intensity of the proposed rezoning and use shall be consistent with development in the area. So this is a compatibility statement. Um, we stated that the development in the area is a mix of single family and multifamily dwellings, subject property abuts a North Area Community Whispering Hills facility to the east and city owned property to the west. The proposed multifamily residential zoning district is applied to properties to the north, required buffering will, be minim will minimize impacts to the single family residential lot adjacent to the property. Existing wetlands on the southern portion of the property will remain so there should be no impact to the majority of homes along Hamlin Court. 
Uh, number four there, the application is consistent with the zoning in the area. We believe it is so. They, any new development will have to meet our land implement regulations as far as buffers, landscaping, parking, and such. There are additional requirements, uh, again, because the north part of the portion of this property has that future uh, downtown mixed use future land use, which uh, in this case, again, operates as an overlay. So on page 51 of your packet, you'll see the same criteria I described in the last agenda item that would be applicable to any new development here as well, including a potentially a reduced set, uh, landscape strip along the, <coughs> the street. So on page 52 of your packet, we recommend approval of the uh, land use change and the rezoning change consistent with this, the maps I described earlier. Um, I do want to mention, though, that Mr. Fisher uh, provided to us not evidence of a scheduled community meeting, but rather a letter that he s s mailed to the surrounding property owners. He uh, stated that he received uh, no response, and then he subsequently also uh, knocked on the door and visited each home within that uh, within the 500 foot radius of this property um, or the notice requirement radius and did speak with several neighbors and I think they had even on an impromptu meetings but he can describe that as, to you. I would ask though that um, that evidence should be considered by you as to whether that is sufficient to meet the standard of the requirement in the comprehensive plan which specifically says that you must have a hold a community meeting at least seven days prior to the first public hearing. If his attempt to meet with the neighbors there meets that intent of, of the comprehensive plan policy, then we would otherwise recommend that you um, uh, consider this application or continue it to the next meeting to allow him to time to um, hold that public meeting. So with that, I'll try and answer any questions you have. Um, I just had one quick question for staff. Originally, when before that requirement went into effect, I think we addressed that. Um, if nobody was going to come, I thought that that was, I mean, that's kind of a known issue. Well, can you tell me what, what is, it seems to me that he did his due diligence for the meeting, but what was the, I can't remember exactly the, I thought I we, we did discuss that. We did, I believe you may have. Um, I'm, I'm going to read the policy from the comprehensive plan. Okay, so policy 1.23.5 of the future land use element of the comprehensive plan specifically states, the city shall require applicants of land use and zoning application submittals to schedule and conduct a community meeting with interested members of the public regarding their application at least seven days prior to the first public hearing. The applicant shall provide notification to all property owners within 500 feet of the subject property of the land use and zoning application and shall notify the city of the meeting as well. So, that's, so he's good. Well, it states they schedule, they, the applicant is supposed to schedule and conduct a community meeting. That was not done. That, a letter was oh. sent to the applicant, the surrounding property owners, asking, do you have any concerns? Please contact me. Hmm. Okay. So. All right. Um, are there questions of staff? Okay. With that, we'll open this to the public. Mr. Fisher, you want to come up? Thank you all members for allowing me to be here tonight. Um, on the public meeting thing, I just want to uh, make sure exactly we understand what happened. June 27th, I sent a letter to all the surrounding property owners asking them if uh, they had any concern and I explained exactly what I was trying to do and I also uh, sent a copy of the maps to showing the zoning changes and that. Uh, did not get any response from any of the neighbors. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pierce sent me an email on August 2nd or 1st saying, you know, um, 
did you notify the property owners? I sent an email back on August 2nd and said, no, uh, I mean, yes, I notified them, sent a letter, but uh, is that suffice or do I need to do anything else? August 13th, I think the date was, I finally got a letter back from Mr. Parrish saying, we might want to reschedule this because you didn't have a public meeting. So we went like uh, 13 days without a response from the city on whether I needed to do anything else other than send letters to the, to the neighbors. When I found out that this might be a concern on Saturday, uh, because I think the intent of the code is that you try to notify the property owners what exactly you're doing and if they have any input, to take that input into consideration. I thought my letter did that. I had no response from any of the property owners. So on Saturday, I actually went in the neighborhood uh, and walked door to door. And uh, luckily, um, uh, one of the property owners was coming home. And uh, I waited until he got out of his truck and approached him and said, hey, I'm Robin Fisher. I'm, I'm uh, you know, this is what I want to do. Do you have any concerns? He said, yeah, I do. And I said, OK, let's talk about them. And then uh, we talked about them. He went and knocked on a couple doors and invited his neighbors to come over. And we had an impromptu meeting uh, at his home. Uh, and he was kind enough to invite his neighbors. And we stayed there for about, a, I stayed for about an hour, hour and a half. And, it's got comfortable enough that I had a soda pop with them. So I think I met the intent of the code, and I think if, uh, if staff had uh, gotten back with me in a timely manner, I would have called a public meeting that nobody responded to. I don't know who I met with, because at the time, nobody really it seemed to you know, indicate from my letter that they wanted to meet with me. But I didn't want this to be a problem in this meeting today, so I did go walk door to door to make sure that I did my due diligence in trying to reach the neighbors and explain my situation. So I would disagree with the staff recommendation or if this was going to be tabled because I think I met the intent of the code in every way I could. Um, the staff report, if you read through it, you, you notice there's a lot of comments about correct, correct, correct. Uh, Judge Charles Harris has owned this property for several, several years, and Judge Harris would tell you that he never was aware that staff was going to take his property that was R3 zoning and change it to conservation. And, um, and so when I got under contract on this piece, uh, I let him know that your property's been changed by the city from R3 to conservation, and it's pretty much not developable. And because of the process that the city makes you go through, uh, that you've got to come and correct the air that I'm here and spent $3,500 on an application fee for zoning and comp plan amendment and trying to correct something that I don't think that personally ever should have been um, the way it is. But that's where we are and I'm willing to, willing to do it. The, uh, um, this site has always had wetlands and has always had uplands. And when they went and made the change in the zoning, they put the uplands on the wrong piece uh, and made that zoning uh, conservation in the part that was wet, they made it R3 in downtown. And I, don't, I think that's probably happened in some other, price, other property in the city. I think, uh, Mr. City Attorney, you might have dealt with this issue before and some zonings that have been changed incorrectly. Um, there's an old map that shows that site with, uh, in 1982, with a development of multifamily on it, and it's in the Uplands area. Um, so, you know, the report's pretty clear. Um, I'm not trying to impact the wetlands. I'm trying to take the Uplands land and change it to multifamily and be able to do a quality development there someday. The concerns that the neighbors had was that the property to the south, which is mostly wetlands, they were concerned because they had gotten, they had called a city and somebody had said for some reason that I might be putting a, a road down that uh, strip behind their home. I'm here to say tonight that I'm not putting a road behind their home and down the strip. Uh, most of my development will be on the northern portion of the property. The only reason I would even go down that area is because I might, uh, according to uh, some preliminary conversations with an engineer that you might be the closest spot to get some sewer because there's a lift station on that Carroll Street in the back. I really don't want to go that way. I'd rather 
deal with everything out on South Street. But, um, and I'm willing to make a condition that we won't put a road behind these people home. Um, but that, in the, in the terrain of the uh, land, that their lot sits about 10 to 12 feet higher than our land anyway in that area behind their home. And uh, we have no desire to impact other than if we had to put some utilities through there to get it to the site. And I will open it up any questions you may have of me. Okay. Um, the, um, are those apartments there right off of, uh, I'm looking at them, are they on the map? Some apartments to the north, sir? Yeah, are those apartments? There's some apartments, so townhomes to the Town, north. Townhomes, okay. I just other. see large roofs and, mm -hmm. um, all right, so I had, as they mentioned, I had concerns with the um, survey um, and the environmental, the dated material. I mean, both, one was 2005, one is 2006. And so I went back to the city and they said the code wasn't specific, but um, did the city ever come back to you and say, hey, we need, we should uh, get an updated delineation? Was there anything mentioned on that at all? No, the city position was, I think, uh, is that the, there's been no development around that site. The property to the east is the school board, and that's been a vacant school for years. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, to the west is a city's compound, uh, which they use for dirt. So I don't think that land has changed since that survey was put out. And I think it's unfair that if you had a, uh, a property that was in a land that was improperly zoned, that got changed for wrong reasons, that you would make an applicant go spend a bunch of more money with environmental studies and surveys and wetland deviation and all those things to correct something that should have never been done before. In 06, there was a gentleman who was going through a St. John permit, and he's the one who did the wetlands delineation mm -hmm. <clears throat> and some of that stuff that made that, uh, why that stuff was available then. Okay. All right. Um. I guess more mine questions are going to be more to staff on this. Okay. So I just, does anybody raise the concerns with you in the recent weeks or week, recent, recent days about this at all? I'm just saying I raised this concern with them since last week. Yes. I just wanted to, I want but you to be aware. The only way I'm aware that there was any concern at all was that I went door to door to talk okay. to the neighbors to make sure that um, I was meeting the intent of the code, and I wanted to make sure if there was some concern that I could address it. So, you know, things like I'm putting a road behind their home wouldn't okay. be uh, uh, misunderstood. Um, all right, Mr. Sievers. Mr. Fisher, uh, like you, I'm kind of aware of the history of uh, Charlie Harris's uh, woes with regard to uh, uh, this particular property, and uh, well aware of uh, once upon a time having the the task of uh, code action to enforce the removal of some uh, concrete slabs that were on the property whenever that plan you just showed us, uh, uh, there was actual construction yeah, that was on, actually, on, uh, on the property way back. <laughs> I think there's still a slab there, sir. Is there? <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I guess um, uh, one of the things, the aerial, that we have on uh, on 54 it looks a lot different <clears throat> than some of the maps uh, as far as the 2005 uh, study. Uh, there looks to me like a lot more uh, vegetation, trees, and large trees. What, what kind of vegetation is there? There trees on the site. I mean, there's some. I couldn't. I'm not a very good garden guy, so I couldn't tell you the type of trees or whatever, but I mean, there's been some, some growth over the years, you know, for the last 20 years where things have popped up and grow, but I mean, it's the area that's, that's uh, uh, was, to me, that was dry, based on all the information I've seen, is still dry today. I, I think there, the, um, but I think where the city has some, um, some R3 zoning on, that area is actually, never should have been R3, it really should have been wetlands and conservation, and we want to try to correct that, sir. 
As far as have you had, I know it's not required by the code currently, uh, a tree survey done on the property? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know, sir. I, I, I haven't done anything. I'm, uh, um, it's very possible when they did the permit for um, the St. John Water Management and there was a permit done by another agency uh, that uh, kind of went through it and did, I think, a tree survey and, and all that kind of stuff on it. As far as uh, the, uh, the ground truthing survey, has that been accepted by St. John's? Is there a letter from St. John's accepting that uh, ground truthing? I think they, they, um, they accepted it all, but I, the, the gentleman didn't go all the way through and get a permit issued, so I don't know um, if, you know, would that be considered accepted or not. They, he applied, he submitted the, the deviation, you know. I mean, as survey. I understand it, we, we certainly have an engineer here. They, they come out and they, they look at it and they will uh, move the stake or agree with it, uh, et, et cetera, as far as uh, the ground truthing by uh, acceptance of the uh, survey as such. I was going to mention, um, there was BKI uh, uh, consultant ecologist. They did go through and um, kind of put, I guess, the different uh, uh, type of uh, trees and stuff in it, in the land, what was on it. My understanding, Mr. Sievers, and um, once I figure out exactly what I want to develop and what I want to do, that I'm going to be required to get an updated survey. I'm going to be required to um, do, um, you know, some more studies, and I'm going to be probably required to uh, meet whatever current code is for development and stuff. And so I'm prepared to do that. Um, I just don't think to the correct this air, I need to have to do that today. But I do know I need to do that before I develop it. And I will be back in front of this body or the city staff for approval. Okay. Uh, on page, uh, I think it's uh, 54, excuse me, 70, um, maybe 74. And I don't there there the is, uh, I don't think sir. that's the correct page, but in any event, there is uh, uh, a flood zone map which seems to encompass a great deal <laughs> of the upland. Uh, have you looked at that or researched that? Yeah. Uh, and what impact, if any, that has upon your uh, proposed development? Yes, sir. I looked at your Area 2 watershed uh, floodplain related service map. And if you look at that map, it clearly shows that it's not that area that I'm asking to be rezoned. It's not in a floodplain or it's it clear to the public. Okay. Another question I have uh, Would you be willing? to commit to uh, assuming that uh, the map as you've given us uh, shows the uh, wetland boundary to a condition of the approval as to a 25 foot uh, buffer around that wetland, undisturbed buffer around that wetland? Uh, no, sir, because I don't know what that commitment really means. <laughs> Okay, you uh, have I mean, not. I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that the development's got. What is the normal commitment for buffers around wetlands? It, it, it can be 15 feet. Uh, Oregon, I, I know in the city we've approved as much as 50 feet. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure what, what that is. I'm not either sure. I mean, th this is a tight site in it anyway. And the fact that uh, it's 11 and a half acres roughly. And I'm dedicating six and a half acres to wetlands area. I think I'm trying to be environmental friendly. So I don't I don't know what that means. So I'd be hesitant about doing it because I don't know exactly what I want to do there yet, sir. Okay.
Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, Mr. Fisher, you said you knocked on doors and had an impromptu meeting. Was that in the Hamlet, Hamlet Court area or the yeah. Carroll Avenue and Morbecca Street area? You had to go within 500 feet of the surrounding areas. And um, we were, I guess where they're doing a rezoning. So the city gave me a map of what area I should, what people I should contact, gave me a list. And three of them are here. So uh, I, I locked, knocked on those doors. Well, you were a councilman in the 80s, weren't you? Um, I think I was 90s. Okay. 96, 97 time frame. I was on the 70s, 77 okay. to 79. <laughs> yeah. And I think we've heard for 30 years the flooding along Morbeka and Carroll Avenue. In fact, uh, with one of these recent rainfalls, I drove around that area and the streets, especially Carroll Avenue at the end, were flooded. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have someone that remained nameless that talks incessantly about this area. But the neighborhood that you had the meeting in, was that Hamlin or the Morbeka area? Yeah. So our zoning requests, we're not, our intention is not to impact the southern portion of our property. Our intentions are impact just the northern port where the uplands are. And so I don't see anything we would do that would affect the flooding on the south part of that, that property. Um, and so uh, I contacted the which I was asked to by the city staff. James, no more that? questions. Pardon me? I don't have any more questions. Member, Member Spidell. I'm confused too. I need to your mic. Turn your what mic. Okay. I'm concerned about what neighborhood you talk to people. I mean, my, my concern was the same. Is it the Hamlin neighborhood? Yes. Yeah, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the same map. Yes, sir. So these people are right around here. Okay. But I'm also concerned about if they were concerned that you were going to build a road, mm -hmm. was it right up against the red line there? Yes, ma'am, behind their homes. Okay. And... and can I ask staff a question? Is is that part of conditional that he does he have to build a road? Mr. Fisher said he didn't want to re build a road. Oh, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. There, so why would you need to? What reason would you have to build a road, if that was their concern? Ms. Spidell, if I can answer, let me yep. further clarify. So the code, if they when he comes in for a site plan, an engineered plan for a, a site plan to develop on this property, mm -hmm. we do have stipulations in the code that we have to have a secondary access if there are, um, I believe, 101 or more residential units of any type. Um, that's uh, a fire department requirement, and that's in our code. Mm -hmm. um, but and I think there are some exceptions depending on the situation as well. So I'd have to look at that and see what that says. But there are requirements about a secondary access for certain types of residential development. How that's done and accomplished, I can't answer, and I can't even answer for this property yet. Okay, what are the buildings to the north of that Hamlin? They're long ro roofs. The school board, the school, the old school. Oh, board. that's the school, school board, school those, board. those, okay. And that's on that upland. That's all on the upland. Okay. That, that, that land's very high. Yeah, thank you. All right, Member Baker. Uh, Mr. Fisher, I do yes, have some of the same concerns. I have very much a concern on the date on the environmental studies, and like you said, you're going to have to have, you know, some of this answered. I would think that that needs to be answered up front, and I also, m my take on the public meeting is probably a little different than yours. It seems to me since you've been in public office and you understand how things go, you have a whole lot more... Um, I'm sure you've run up against plenty of lawyers in your day mm -hmm. with things. It just seems to me just putting this off two weeks, then there wouldn't be any question. And if you're doing any sort of a project, it just seems to me you wouldn't want somebody coming back halfway through saying, wait a minute, you didn't do the public meeting according to this. And then you have to get somebody, a lawyer involved to help you out with that. It just seems... <laughs> 
to me reasonable just mm -hmm. to go ahead and publish it and do it, even though I'm not knocking you for what you did do. Please don't hear that okay. at all. Well, I have two concerns. One is um, I think there's been some debate among you what, it, what was the intent of the code. And I think Mr. Williams already asked him what, what did they say in the past. I think the, the intent is, is rather the, the applicant tried to reach out. And as far as June 27th, you know, which is what, over almost 60 days, I sent a letter trying to reach out to everybody. If nobody responds to a letter, it's hard to say you can have a public meeting because you don't know who's coming, right? So, um, so then I went a step further to go meet with anybody who might have as a concern, which I thought was most applicants don't do that. I do. I have been in, in the uh, uh, public eye, and if uh, uh, if I had known that I needed to say I'm having a public meeting, I don't know who's coming, uh, you know. But it's this day. I, I would have did that, and so. I'm not familiar with your being in the public in, in the political world for a while. I'm not familiar with that thing. I'm, I'm familiar with your, the intent to reach out to your neighbors, and I felt like I did that. And the other option is I have a contract on this property that's set to close prior to your next meeting, and so it's a huge risk for me to financially close on this with uh, uh, not having this decision or having a, feel, a good feel whether or not I can get this done or not. And I want to say again, once again, I personally don't feel like I should be here. Because if staff hadn't made that change and took Upland and made it conservation, then and took in private property and did that to it, this wouldn't I wouldn't have to be here. It was zone R3, and I think it should it should have really it clearly states by all evidence that it should be R3. All right. Are there any questions of Mr. Fisher? All right, thank you. And I want to remind you at the end, uh, you have the ability to rebut, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, staff, is it possible, I did want to, there was discussion about, and I think you even sent me the file. Is it possible to look at a map of the previous 2009 change? Just to, I mean, what I'm trying to, I just wanted to look at it. So it was zoned R3, how much, well, maybe you can just tell us, was it all zoned R3? Was it, was it uh, divided up? Was it, what was the makeup? Because I thought that in 2009, what I thought we did, as I was actually part of that too, I, I recall the city making a major effort to contact every single, notify every single property owner, and then what they did was they did a Basically, a six-month, if I recall right, they did a six-month, um, and, and you were the city attorney at this time, so you can answer this too. But um, so it basically said, look, you have six months to come in and object, and if you don't object, then it stands. Does that sound about right? Correct. Okay. So um, not that I'm, I totally understand what you're saying, but the other part of that is I'm looking at what you said on how they swapped and it's because that was one of the things I noticed too was the previous zoning and in what you're going to and I knew that from the 2006 delineation map it seemed awkward that that you had uplands where it said that you had it, it did seem awfully awkward so but is it possible to look at that I mean is it yeah, I, I'm looking at what we sent you. Uh, the images. I don't have it on me, so that's why. I understand. <laughs> the images that are that are attached to the agenda item that we sent you from 2009 aren't very clear, so I really can't oh. say. What I can say, though, is or that. Or if you can describe, but. The intent of the of that change mm -hmm. it says on on one of the images here is that the comprehensive plan amendment was to change the land use on properties that had a residential. Uh, land use with 15 units per acre and proposed to be changed and that's all it says so I, and then the map is not very clear as to what it's being changed to okay. uh, so without some additional research I couldn't really answer your question all right member Richardson it says on page 43 
ordinance number 5 1993 removed a portion of the property from r3 zoning district based upon the designation of conservation due to the presence of wetlands so it it was an ordinance enacted by council and the pnz in 1993 wasn't right, right. I'm, on that same page excuse me thank you um under land use history the original comprehensive plan in 1988 it says was designated conservation and residential conservation land use has been in existence since the beginning of, this, of the comprehensive plan yeah so it, say, it seems it appears that some portion of this property had conservation land use on it and my understanding is the way that conservation land use was originally created was based on a wetland in, a national wetland inventory map that was provided to us by the feds, the feds at that time, that was available from the feds at that time. So it was really subjective. It's just kind of based on large scale, where do we think wetlands are? We, and we were encumbered by the state at that time to come up with something of conservation land use of some sort, and that's what we did at that time. So it's, it's a land use that's in effect since then, and it's been processed the way it is being proposed to you tonight since that time as well my point is it didn't just happen in the last five years or ten years correct it happened in 1993 it appears at, at some portion 88 yeah and then again in 93 there was another change yes sir but i thought there was what you sent me you said there was a modification on this in 2009 yeah and then there were additional changes in 2009 so I, i'd have to look at the uh deeper to find out exactly what that particular change was right. about so to, to tag on to what he was saying as well so it's always been observed within the city that when they did this configuration of the wetlands maps they knew that they weren't accurate and it's always been agreed that as they ground truth them the zonings will change the maps will change and it isn't until they actually ground truth it rezone it but it was agreed that these would change because it was old data applied to it. It was very vague data. So for, for these applications to come in, it is expected for them to change, um, to swap on some of these conservations, but it, it really depends upon the ground truthing that is done and the certifications. So, all right, so, so we move this meeting along a little bit. Can we get the next uh, card, please? Joseph Jordan. Hello, my name is uh, Joseph Jordan. I'm uh, 1832 Hamlin Court. I'm probably the most affected neighbor of this, uh, <clears throat> this property and what Mr. Fisher plans to do. Um, the portion you guys are speaking about the uh, the highlands area I mean we're very familiar with it we can see it from our property uh, it's it is high and dry it's sand dirt there are um, some uh, concrete pads on there uh, the area that the conservation area that seems to be the most uh, concerned for us is behind where he wants to develop um, and he's given us some assurance that he doesn't want to build a road there, which uh, I guess somebody at the city had said that there might have to be a road there uh, at some point. And that I don't think is absolutely true um, because there can be two inlets and outlets. I'm also a licensed real estate agent, but I believe there's two inlets and outlets that can be done on the front of the property. Um, of all the people that would develop this property, I would prefer that Mr. Fisher do it um, because he has a good track record. There are a few developers that have gone along that area and they've failed at projects. So him coming in to do this would be a positive um, movement for that area, I believe. Uh, he's also um, talked about um, in good faith potentially putting some sort of barrier that would limit traffic from South Street to um, our property. Uh, I, I personally, as long as the development happens forward and next to the Whispering Hills 
development, I have no issue uh, as long as there's a little bit of a buffer so that I don't have to see um, uh, higher density residential um, because we did buy the property with the, uh, you know, having the quiet enjoyment of the conservation area that is behind us. But all of the area that, the, that, that light residential area where we thought the road would be built, um, really he has no plans to develop and uh, I believe he's acting in good faith. So in my opinion, I'm, I'm okay with this going forward and I am the most affected person. Um, I'm probably the only person that would, um, well, maybe and um, the other na neighbors that would actually see uh, the development. So again, of all the people to develop this, I would prefer that Mr. Fisher do it. So if you let that lapse and somebody else uh, come in at a later point, um, I'd be more concerned. I did, when I first heard it would be developed, I did have some opposition, but we did have a very detailed meeting in my living room um, that he really did address all the concerns that we had, and uh, I feel like he is acting in good faith, so. All right, are there any questions of Mr. Jordan? Thank you. Thank you. Next card, please. Brian Palmer. Hello. Um, I'm Captain Brian Palmer, a lifelong resident at Titusville. I've owned several businesses here. Um, I was also got called into the meeting that we had with the uh, with him and, and, you know, our concern was also mainly the road. Uh, my wife and I bought this property approximately seven years ago, just under seven years ago. We were kind of assured that nobody would be able to build behind us because of its status, the way it was. Um, I understand things change. However, that it was one of the pretenses that we did purchase that, that, that piece of property um, there. Um, you know, he is correct in saying he did send out a notice and everything. However, I will point out the fact that it was mailed in a State Farm envelope, which looked just like every kind of sales gimmick envelope mm -hmm. you get that nobody ever opens, everyone throws out. And it was delivered on July 6th. So everyone's just finished a holiday weekend. Everyone's got a pile of mail. I, I personally feel that was done deliberately so that it would, that's why nobody else probably contacted you. You know, I mean, personally, I think that was done on purpose so that, you know, people didn't know that this meeting was happening. Um, he also assured uh, my wife as well as Joe, you know, that, uh, uh, that there was not going to be a road put there and to limit the access back there, which I am totally good with. That's kind of our, yeah, our, our, that's one of my main things too. However, you know, I also brought up, well, if, you, if there's water lines and stuff going back there, well, they're going to have to put some kind of road in there just for there to be access. And then, you know, everybody in this room knows there's going to be someone that just jumps that fence and that just becomes a little drug corridor from one neighborhood to the other. You know, um, I got my truck back last night uh, or yesterday from the Tysville Police Department because it was stolen the night before out of my driveway. Mm -hmm. And I live right next to Joe and I'd be the second closest homeowner to this. My, my address is 1840. If you want to look me up, you can see it there. Um, so I am quite concerned about that. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where, where uh, I think I, where I'm sitting on that. I, um, I would like to see more information regarding exactly what kind of use it's going to get um, before I, you know, have like a final decision on, on what my part is on that, you know, but I mean, I hope you can understand my concern with it. And um, everything I said is easily 
backed up, <laughs> including my truck being stolen. You know, the, literally the night you were at uh, you were at Joe's house that that night. Okay, it but was, oh, if you could address night, the day after, if you could address the commission. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, because you're addressing the commission, I mean that's great that you guys are having a sidebar, but <laughs> okay, sorry, I, but. But yeah, you know, that's 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 my main concern in it. Um, that neighborhood in general, there's a lot of through traffic that uses that Lane Street around there. Um, it wasn't more than a month ago there was somebody running from a, a Titusville police officer that turned their lights off and came running down the road and skittered into my neighbor's driveway and hid from the police and you know and I'm the one that called the police on it you can go call you know, there's a there's a 911 call on that also so I am concerned about bringing more of an element like that or giving them a thoroughfare behind my house as well as them have you know from the front so okay uh, I'd leave it at that as far as the environmental stuff if you want to hop over my fence right now, I'll give you a pair of boots and you go go walk about 300 feet through the thorns and you'll be mushing through water. Um, I've had bobcats in my backyard on my chicken coop. The chickens didn't like it. They didn't last. Um, you know, there's a coyote back there. I've seen it three times cross 405. So there is quite a bit of wildlife back there. I know for a fact we have at least four owls because I listen to them when I'm in my backyard. So. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Are there any questions? No? All right. Quick question from staff. Um, discussion on the secondary road. And the only thing that I see, I, I'm looking at the, the map uh, on the, I guess it's the south side. Is that supposed to be some type of uh, the uh, it's trees? You have Lane Street, and then you have the Hamlin Court development. Then you have the Brewer Court development. But in between there, is that supposed to be like some type of easement for potential connection later on, or is that just a is that for the utility? Because I'm looking at the concerns, and it's it doesn't seem like they they would be able to put a secondary, they wouldn't, couldn't put a road, wouldn't put a road that far down. So it looks like you're looking at a, uh, the area behind the houses that are on Mor Morbega, is that right? And not Hamlin. Yeah, Mor right. Okay. So it looks like there is a public right of way behind there. That's what it looks like to me. I'd have to confirm that. Right. Because um, and it might have been part of an old plaque or something. Like yeah, and this, I'm just wondering. It doesn't. It might not be anything that's really usable. It's a paper um, right away. Well nothing constructed there currently. I think with the um, recent developments, a wider access or boulevard accommodates everything above 99 or whatever. It's 10 something, 101 houses. Right. Our code says I believe it's 101 or more. Uh, there so, has to be a secondary access. But what I've seen um, time and time again is a wider, so the fire department signs off on a wider access road so that the idea has always been so that one access point doesn't block if there's a fire. But I'm, I'm looking at the development of this property and this doesn't seem conducive for really any development on that sliver of land because <laughs> by the time you add in um, by the time you add in all the factors of uh, buffers or anything like that, and you can't connect to the back side, the south side of that anyway, it looks like. Well, you could, but it'd be very over the top. So I'm just saying, as far as the residents go, I don't see how that would even remotely be a possibility um, because there's cheaper alternatives to connect to 405 or, yeah, South Street, so. All right, can we have next card, please? No more cards. All right, so we'll, well, Mr. Fisher, would you like to, well, let me do this, huh? I have questions of Right, me too, and then, be, and here's why I want to do it a little bit differently. 
I want to give you the opportunity to rebut even what I have to say, okay, before I close it back to the public, okay? Um, Member Baker, well, hold, sorry, I got Mr. Richardson here. As I recall, in that area, somewhere between Carroll Avenue and Morbecca, there is a lift station or something like that there? I can't answer that question, I'm not sure. I think there is. Yeah, there's a lift station right there, somewhere in that area. That's why you have that sliver. Uh, Member Baker. I have some questions um, for the city on page 44. Um, there, number one says uh, under staff comment, the proposed development will serve as infill and utilize existing infrastructure. And then further down on number five, staff comment says the subject property does not qualify as infill development. And then on number six, on the next page, I believe it is. Uh, I didn't write that one down. I think it says, goes back again, one way or the other. So can you explain that to me, please? Sure. Uh, so you, I'm sorry. Under comment no, one. Number one. Okay. Staff comment and number five, staff comment contradict each other. So our answer to number one, uh, the question is, to the extent to which the proposed amendment is contiguous to an existing develop development area, which has developed in a manner providing a compact contiguous development pattern for the proposed amendment. And our answer was, while there are some vacant properties in the area, this part of the city has been developed with roads and water sewer infrastructure, which is available immediately to the property. The proposed development will serve as infill and utilize existing infrastructure. So in that response, we it was a, a very um, strict sense of the word, what is infill, that's a vacant lot, it has the infrastructure there, you don't have to extend the infrastructure to it, so it could be considered infill in that case. However, um, I do acknowledge what you say here on, pointed out on number five. Mm -hmm. The question is, from the code, the extent to which the amendment will not result in sprawl development pattern as determined by chapter 163 of the statutes, it will not discourage infilling of more appropriate areas available for development within existing development area boundaries and staff stated future land use policy element or future land use element policy 1.7.7 of the subject property does not qualify as infill development so per that particular policy it appears that the intent that we state even though that may appear to not be consistent about policy we state that the intent of the requested action is to correct the land use and zoning designations based upon on-site wetlands determination consistent with another policy in the conservation land use uh, con conservation element policy number one 6.3 and future land use policy 1.16.2 so this information is provided to you to weigh whether you believe that this is the request is consistent with the uh, comprehensive plan I would say that in a strict sense that the property ha is inside an urban service area uh, there are utilities immediately adjacent to the property to serve it in the event it is developed mm -hmm. And so the only issue really it seems to be on this property is environmental, potentially. Right. Is that it? That is it. All right, so as you know, I've contacted you several times. They've been contacted, the city attorneys, talked to them both. Um, and my concern was that um, this was a 14-year-old study, and, and I guess, you know, let's just say that Yes, the delineation was done in 2006, so a 13-year-old. And my issue was that I asked staff, you know, did they, is this something that's normal that they would accept a, a study so old? I went so far as to, to, let, to ask, you know, because I said, I've never seen this before. I've, I've sat on this board since 2001, 2002. And every single time that I've ever uh, looked at delineations, environmental studies, they were recent. So I, I tried to ascertain why. Why would we accept something um, so old? And the answer I got back was, well, the code doesn't, it doesn't state that they have to give us a date. And that, that really perplexed me because I was like, 
wouldn't matter. Um, it would still be an administrative decision because the St. John's Water Management District requires there to be something within five years old, within five years of time, to do the, to even accept the delineation. And so my issue with this is specifically with the delineation. Um, maps change, uh, wetlands change. We, I've gone through wetland trainings at the yin yang and the one thing that they tell you is they move, they change, they shrink, it's, it's a plus, it's a minus, um, but no matter what, the map is going to change. So that's why they, they certify them. Now I've heard them certifying for a very long time, but in this case, I've asked, it, what was presented wasn't certified. I didn't feel like I was getting a clean answer from the city. Um, so I says, fine, you know, I've never done this before, but I'm gonna call another city and see what their um, process is. And they said, well, and this was the city of Melbourne. They said they might accept it and um, that it depends. They would have to look, but it, it might be acceptable if nothing's changed. And I thought, okay, you know, that's reasonable. And then that's what I'm hearing about this property right now. So I thought, well, okay, let me talk to the um, St. John's Water Management District because ultimately it's gonna go to them no matter what. Um, and they said, absolutely not, they would not accept it. And they said, they might accept it if it was recertified or redone, um, up updated is what they said. So what would have to happen is the lines would have to be um, retruth, which it could be that it's just, they said it might, no matter what, they said this line will change, okay? Um, especially it being so old. And then that kind of was disheartening to me because the last thing I want to do is prevent development. Um, and uh, on the other hand, chances are, you know, the land, the, the line hasn't changed. And so mainly my issue was with the city because I felt like it should have been an administrative decision to say, bring us something new. But I can understand the city saying, well, the code doesn't say this. On the other hand, this is why I said, in other instances, city staff has said that we don't want to make redundant code. So what we do is we just say, well, it's in other, it's in the state law. It's in, you know, let's just say it's in the St. John's Water Management District. So we're not going to redo code twice when we have to go to them anyway. And so I am expecting an administrative decision to say, I need something within five years. So. Ultimately, what my issue is, it isn't with the zoning, it isn't with the flume, it isn't, it isn't even the, the map is fairly correct. It's the fact that we're coming in now and saying this is the line and we're dividing it up and not knowing where that line falls. And then you have to go back in and redo it again because it has to go through St. John's Water Management District and it has to be certified. And like I said, the last thing I wanna do is prevent development but I felt like there should have been some due diligence on the city side to reject this and say, let's give us something newer, but you're the experts, but I mean, I've been doing this long enough that I've went so far as to ask, when have you ever seen this before? And the response I got back was, what I have seen was they were a year old. And that coincided exactly what my point was. If it's a year old, it's within the five-year range, and that would be that would be acceptable. Um, so it's not like I want to say no, but I want to say, look, if the commission decides to move forward with this, then we absolutely need to make sure that something is hard-coded to say we want new information. Um, my point to city staff was pretty clear, and and believe me, I'm I'm more than I think highly of all of the city staff, but this was an oddball for me. Um, and this is specifically why I wanted to give you the opportunity, I wanted to be able to say something and then for you to um, come back and um, change my mind or, or explain to me how I'm wrong or, um, or ease my fears, you know. 
Um, but the one thing that I had issues with was that, um, well, it doesn't matter. I don't want to get off my soapbox, but I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. Um, I know that it's not specifically dated, but I, it's, we, the city knows that it's mandated by the St. John's Water Management District, so no matter what, you need something new. Um, and that was it. That's all I'm going to say. Are there any questions of staff or anything you want to say? And then we'll bring Mr. Fisher up to rebut. Okay. Oh, hold on. Uh, Member Spidell. I'm concerned about, this looks far more like a conservation um, plat of land than it does a residential. And I, am con I will echo exactly your concerns. You know, okay. 20, oh, that's 14 years. And I'm concerned far more about wetlands and these endangered species. You've got a list of quite a few endangered species on that original. That's, we need to preserve those things. I just don't see an awful lot of, I think, Quay, is it, Mr. Fisher, I'm going to ask you, is it 50% of the, of the partial can be developed? I don't think it's 50%. The entire parcel is, uh, I think, 11 and a half acres, and 5.13 acres of it is um, wetlands. And um, but it's uh, let me interrupt you. For, so it's wetlands from that original study, though, on the date of that original study. Is that correct? It was wet. It was wetlands in 1982 when they put a site plan on it. And okay. it was the same wetlands in 2006. I, I'm going to debate that it's the same yeah. same yeah. wetlands. Yeah, I, I think, think because same. of because of the changes we've seen in the environment. Right. And, and I would say to you that <clears> in those wetlands, um, you have a R3 zoning in it today. I that understand. That was uh, you know incorrectly put there. I understand. And so some of your wetlands. And so our goal is to correct that. What's uplands we would like to develop. What's wetlands we want to reserve them and, and put the proper zoning in them. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do today. Um, so part of that six uh, or so acres that's uplands, that sliver down the right might be another half acre or acre. I don't know the exact uh, dimension of that. So that's really not going to be developed either. So it's probably developing about 6.3 acres, I think, altogether when it's all said and done, we would like to try to do. With the new codes, when you got to put storm water and, and, and all that kind of stuff, it's probably going to be less than that that we actually develop. And we're going to have to prove to you at some point that um, this site is developable. And if we're going to try to impact wetlands, we're going to have to go in there and, and, and mitigate for it and all that. Um, there's a lot of things that got to be done before you ever see anything develop on this site. And I just think more preliminary work yeah. needs to be done. More facts and figures for today, from today needs to be, especially on environmental and wetlands. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure why I, I heard you all, but um, you know, I've been a county commissioner. I've dealt with every 16 municipalities. And uh, I can tell you that in the North of Art, personally, I think making development harder is not a good thing. And sometimes I see that up here. There's a lot of things that I've got to do to make this improvements, and there's a lot of money going to be spent. To ask me to spend that money and maybe still come back to this board with this decision, I don't think it's fair. And I'll also be here to tell you that um, the wetlands, there's been no development around the site. So if you haven't had any development around it, it's hard to change it a lot. A lot of other places, you would probably possibly have a, a development here, a development here or there, and that could have maybe possibly impacted. The city owns a property to the west. The school board's been vacant for a number of years. And so there's, and the, those homes have been there for several years. So I would disagree with you. I think that, I think I still, I do have to provide a, updated map at the time of development 
Can you tell me what the requirements are if I was the, when, I, when it's time to develop it? Six months. So at the time of a site plan, submittal will need up to date information within six months, date of the submittal. And if it, just so you know, if it is determined that the information that's provided to us at that time is totally different from what's approved tonight, or, then you might have to come back again to you to amend the, this, desig, this uh, conservation land use. But if it's the same, then he can go forward with the information he provides to us at that time. Uh, just as a point of clarification, if uh, the city council ultimately approves this, the site plan, et cetera, this commission never sees again. So it's only if you change in boundaries of the comp plan or zoning. This commission, and, and that's one of the reasons why we ask lots of questions. That's one reason why I ask about the, the buffer, because what staff does with it is up to staff. And so this is our only time <laughs> to ask a, a something uh, because that's the way the system is. Mm -hmm. So just so you know. Yeah. And the gentleman, um, it was July 4th. I was leaving town on the 29th. I sent the letters out before I left town. And um, I think his wife said he actually got it on the 3rd. And I would have thought somewhere between the 3rd and the, tonight that, you know, or Saturday, I would have heard from somebody if they had a concern. So I didn't do it intentionally to try to not get response. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you. And we'll close this uh, to the public. Um, Mr. Severs. Uh, just as a just as a reminder, um, what the uh, comprehensive plan says: as of 2009, the wetlands shown on the conservation land use. On the future land use map, uh, were established using the National Wetlands Inventory Map of 1988. These wetlands shown on this map have not been ground truth. In order to provide more accurate mapping of wetlands, when the city receives a wetland delineation on civic sites, the delineation will be accepted by the city of Titusville, and the future land use map will be amended accordingly. That's what it says. So um, in my mind, uh, the question is whether when the city receives, and that's, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, this is an administrative decision, or unless the city council wants to make the decision about uh, whether you've received an updated map. I don't think that should be dumped on us to decide that. And I, I think that, uh, uh, if they want to process this application, then uh, I, I assume the city has accepted this map. Otherwise, they shouldn't process it. Uh, that's, that's only being fair to the applicant and fair to this commission. If you're going to submit something to it, I assume you accept that this is an acceptable uh, delineation as such. And that was my thoughts as well, is that I, I didn't blame the applicant. I thought it should have been stopped up front. Um, I think it should have, I truly felt it should have been up front. I've, and that's why I came and I asked for previous acceptances of something so old. I didn't get anything. Uh, I went to the city attorney's office and I asked for opinion, but, and I sent you an email, and but I didn't hear. And so maybe you have an opinion now, but I'm sure um, but I wanted your opinion on this at that time, too. Um, here's the issue um, in my mind. So we say, yes, I mean, you make a very valid point that it shouldn't be, that burden should not be put on the applicant. And I can agree to a certain ex extent, I do. Um, but if that be the case, okay, then I think that and then Peggy made this suggestion too, we definitely need to make a change, request a change to be made to put that in there. But at the same time, it, it kind of makes me worried because um, how many more times are we gonna hear, well, it's not dated. I, I didn't have that dated information. And I did make a point that if somebody was to submit a, let's just say a 30 year old delineation, and according to this logic, it would be accepted. 
that I wouldn't think it would be, but I mean, in truth be told, then that means I could accept the 1988. <laughs> but um, I'm just making the point that um, I'm shocked. I'm truly shocked at this. Um, so if, if, like I said, Melbourne made some sense to me. So I do have one question of staff then. So we go through this and the lines change. Then what? What happens when um, the line moves a little bit in the map? Just a little bit. Do we need to, what do we need to do then? It, wait a minute, it goes to administrative, that's right, because that was changed. It's, it's considered a minor change, isn't it? I'm not sure what you're referring to. I, I assume that you're asking is when they submit for a permit for a site plan? No, I'm talking about the zoning on it. The zoning in the future land use map will change according to the delineation. Correct. There, we know no. the delineation map will change, and that's why I say this, what was submitted is not accurate. There would be no rezoning without going through the proper process where the rezoning would come before the legislative body. But, no, but there, is a, there was a process implemented years ago that it gave the discretion to the city administrator to make minor deviations or minor changes on if, if uh, you're saying that's not the case anymore? My understanding is that practice ceased before I started working here. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't change the boundaries of the land. You used to, so. <laughs> yeah. You used to. That's possible. There might have been a statute that might have allowed that, but that's but, um, not the case now. All right. Um, so then that being the case, what's going to happen when the map is different? The delineation is different than what you have. What we have is the same information that was used in order to create the conservation land use with the comp plan. So we, the comp plan asks the applicant to ground truth that, to provide that information to us. So as we responded to you in an email, uh, we don't have anything to base a requirement that they provide to us, something that's accurate within a certain amount of time from today's date. So we take that information, face value, uh, compare it with any information that we might have, which again I stated was already based on old data. Um, and use that. If that is unacceptable, then I, you can make that recommendation to, you make whatever recommendation you can to the city council. I would say this though, if you have an, we have an applicant who submits an application for a land use change and we ask them to give us something more up to date and they reject that and say, I'd still like to be heard at the public hearing. We don't have a basis to say they, to tell them that they cannot be heard at the public hearing. So that's what we see here in this case. We don't have anything to base uh, a requirement to say we need this uh, environmental study with done complete in the past six months, for example. Now, when they come in for a site plan and engineering, we're going to require that we need up-to-date information at that stage. And if they provide that information and it's totally completely inconsistent with what we have here tonight, they might have to come back to you to get that change done. So it's the, the applicant's peril. That's what I'm asking, though, is that the the ground truthing determines the difference between what's conservation and wetlands and what's considered uplands. And so when that line moves, I mean, we are literally doing an overlay on saying this is, this is uplands, this is by that 13-year-old delineation marker. And I'm just simply asking, so when that doesn't align up, what happens then? Do we have to go through rezoning again? to do a correction from that misalignment? I'm not understanding your question about the misalignment. Uh, I guess a better way of saying, if I gave you a 30-year-old delineation map, the city would accept that as truthful. If it is more accurate than the so information that we have? Yeah, the point it's more is, is that it's completely off, okay? And so now I, it's an acre difference, two acres difference, okay? from what is considered conservation and what is going to be considered, uh, you know, downtown or whatever we're zoning this. But the point is, is that so now the zoning is intact for that. The land uh, density units per acre is based on that. What happens then when it, there is a discrepancy 
because you've accepted a 30-year-old delineation that's inaccurate. How would we know that? Well, other than the information that's provided to us by the applicant, it may be more I'm giving you a wild date. scenario, but that scenario seems to it would work. I think that the scenario you're describing is in this situation, if the rezoning turns out to not cover the land that he wants to build upon, then the applicant would have to provide an up-to-date wetland delineation showing the accurate line of where that upland is. I guess and we're then, talking past each other because I'm simply saying, does the zoning change or does the zoning hold that was approved? Would it do, the, the zoning does not change without your approval, without your recommendation and city council's and approval. And so you're saying that it would have to come back through here again to okay. correct. That's, that's the issue that I have. We, we cannot change the boundaries of any zoning district or land. And so category. that's why I'm saying you shouldn't accept 13 year old delineation, knowing that there would be a problem, knowing that St. John's wouldn't accept it, knowing that you have to have a at ground truth again. Um, and so and administratively, you could say no. I would have thought. I would have thought you would have said, well, St. John's isn't going to accept it. So, Chairman, if, if, if I may, the, the applicant is insisting on bringing this before the public hearing. We didn't have a basis to say we are not going to let you and go. So that's why I, I asked the applicant. I said, did the city staff say anything to you about and it seems to me that nothing was said from a city staff point of view that it was an issue at all. We accepted from both sides, I heard that. We accepted the information as more up to date than what we had currently. So we took that information. So if they go through a site plan and it turns out to be wrong or different, because they have to provide us more up to date, something within six months of the date, the middle of a site plan anyway, they have to come back to you. That just doesn't seem. It just seems crazy to me, honestly. I mean, I don't know any other way I can put it. I know that I shouldn't penalize or should penalize the applicant for something like this, but I, then if we accept it, then I believe that we need to make sure that the policies change. That, but I mean, how many more times are we going to have to do this because of, of data being accepted that we know that doesn't even get to a uh, site plan? But. All right, um, Vice Chairman Sievers. And getting back to the agenda item, it's, it appears as if we're asked uh, two things. One, a comprehensive plan amendment, and the second is rezoning. Uh, it's the, the two issues. I do not see any uh, draft ordinances. I'm just looking back at page 39 of the recommended action at this stage. I, I'm assuming I, I'm Correct. Uh, as far as, uh, and I realize there can be some debate, but I believe that the applicant did uh, substantially comply with the notice requirement of our comprehensive plan. That's me speaking, but that's, uh, I feel as though there was substantial compliance uh, as such. Uh, based upon that and based upon the language of the comprehensive plan, and I'm address the comprehensive plan first, um, I would uh, move that we recommend to the City Council approval of the Comprehensive Plan Amendment uh, subject to two, two conditions. One, that uh, the City enter into the record written certifications of the acceptance of the ground truthing or alternatively, it's either one, the St. John's provides a written uh, certification as to the ground truthing. That's the first condition. And the second condition would be that the, um, uh, there would not be any road behind the properties on, um, uh, the butt up to uh, Hamlet. Hamlet Court or Lane, whatever it is. That's the two conditions that I would suggest in that motion. All right. Um, is there a second? Do I have a second? So we'll go to, for a third time. 
Is there a second? All right, the motion dies. Uh, Member Spidell, if you had a, something you want to say? I see that Mr. Fisher's expense is a peril to purchasing his land. Is that is that a correct assumption without this updating? I, again, it's the applicant's risk. So that was that was my definition of peril. If their information they provide to us at the site plan is consistent with what's approved tonight, they don't have to come back to you. Okay. What, what was that in, what did you say? If the site plan that is submitted later on and the environmental information is provided at that time, should be more up to date, is consistent with what we have here today as far as wetland delineation, there's no reason for them to come back to you. It's if there is a reason to, to change the boundaries, that's when they have to come back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I mean, I, I mean, I just, it's, I don't, I don't, honestly, I, I don't have an issue with approving this myself. I just see, I don't, my issues are more with staff and with accepting the report. Um, but, um, Member Richardson. Yes, my main concern is the community meeting. You heard the guy in the, on the second row, I don't remember his name, tell me he got the notice in a State Farm envelope. Now, in all seriousness, if I got the notice in a State Farm envelope, it would go in the trash. So I don't think there was really a community meeting. And I would make a motion to table this item until the next P and Z meeting where you can have a community meeting with okay. the neighborhoods. The 500 feet, which includes Morbeka, Smith Drive, um, Carroll Avenue, and Hamlin Court. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I considered, I considered making that, uh, bringing it up in the beginning to whether the board accepted this uh, in the beginning. Um, is that a motion? He made a motion. So, um, is there a second? I second. Okay. Pick, pick. Who you want to second it? So. All right. So we have a motion to table until the next meeting, and we have a second. So. This is what's on the table, so if we can get a vote on this, please. Member Spidell? Uh, yes. Member Baker? Yes. Vice Chairman Severs? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. All right, so motion's tabled until next meeting for two weeks. What day is that? September 4th. Okay, September 4th. All right. Mr. Chairman, yeah, if I may, can I ask for a, uh, a break for about five minutes before we Actually, that's what. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we take a break. However long. All right. That's what so you we'll get in, for having that walk. I always so say that. we'll adjourn in exactly 10 minutes. Eight oh, we'll just say 8.05, nobody can be late this time. <laughs> Thank okay. you.
everybody's ready. Yes. All right. You go to uh, <coughs> is it item 9C. 9C is a comprehensive plan amendment, a regular text amendment. So this is amend the language or policies of the city's comprehensive plan. So this begins on page 84 of your packet. And I'll go through the agenda item cover sheet here. So comprehensive plan amendment CPA number 3-2019 for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity for review, the state land planning agency, and to bring back their uh, comments and when that comes back to us, then it will come back before you again for another series of public hearings before adoption. On May 28th of this year, at the request of a citizen, City Council approved advisability to review and clarify the city's comprehensive plan requiring that new development located in the city's area of critical concern, and if you're not familiar with that, that is the, water, the city's water uh, area. This is where we uh, receive or we pump out our, our, our potable water. Um, that be required to connect to reclaimed water system or provide dry lines. Conservation element policy number 1.14.13 and the infrastructure element policy 5.2.4 contain identical language requiring all new development in the area of critical concern to connect to the reclaimed water system or install dry lines for future connection. We are proposing language in, um, at the request of the city council that requires new development within the area of critical concern to connect to reclaimed water when services available or provide dry lines consistent with the provisions of the Code of Ordinances. That's new language. An excerpt from Chapter 21 of the City's Code of Ordinances uh, related to the provision of reclaimed water is included in this packet. I'll refer to it in a moment. It should be noted that it is staff's intention to propose amendments to Chapter 21 of the Code to be considered during the Comprehensive Plan Amendment adoption process after we receive comments from the State land planning agency of, their, of the amendment after transmittal. That will, and we believe that this language will provide flexibility for council in the event that reclaimed water will not be available to a site so as to address a taking claim. Also attached is a copy of the current area of critical concern showing vacant land greater than 10 acres. The map depicts uh, any of these properties that are within conservation land use. So I'll refer you to page uh, 86 of your packet, and that begins the ordinance proposed to amend the comprehensive plan. At the bottom of that page of 86, which is the first page of the ordinance, you'll see the new section, there's section one of the ordinance. The City of Titusville's comprehensive plan is hereby amended by adopting comprehensive plan amendment number 3-2019, amending policies 1.14.313 of the conservation element to read as follows. All new development located in the area of critical concern will be required to connect to the reclaimed water system prior to occupancy or provide dry lines for future connection with additional language in accordance with the provisions of the Code of Ordinances. The same language would be added to section in section two of this ordinance under policy 5.2.4 of the infrastructure element. On page 88 of your packet, we've included the excerpt from chapter 21 of the Code of Ordinances, and this is addressing specifically reclaimed water. So it's a fairly large section. We included the whole portion here related to reclaimed water, including uh, definitions, purpose statement on page 89 of your packet, promulgation and enforcement of reclaimed water service procedure regulations, beginning in that same page, 89 of your packet under section 21-282. On page 91 of your packet, in that same chapter 21 of the Code of Ordinances, under section 21-290 of the city's Code of Ordinances, stated, titled, Connection Required. And then further down, it's just some information that it's probably not going to be relevant here if we got it related to um, fees. On page 98 of your packet, we've included a map that shows 
properties that are 10 acres or more in, area, in the areas of critical concern. We have, the city has two areas of critical concern. You can see them in the black boundaries on this map. These areas have additional development standard regulations to help protect our aquifer area or our, our recharge areas. In the red on that map, on page 98 of your packet, you'll see vacant land, 10 acres or more, versus uh, our conservation land use overlaid on that as well. We believe this application, this uh, amendment will provide some flexibility uh, for city council to make a determination as to whether an applicant, when they request that um, they cannot, they do not want or are unable to put in dry lines in the, for a new subdivision, for example, or new development um, in the area of critical concern, that the city council can make a determination as to whether that is warranted to give them an exemption from that. With that, I'll try and answer any questions you have about this. Okay, are there are questions of staff. I uh, do. Mm -hmm. oh, Mr. <clears throat> Richardson. Um, you first. As I recall, but this is old news. Okay, the black boundaries designate the arid areas of critical concern, right? Correct. And Dwight, as I recall, aren't some of those well fields along Barna and what used to be Sun Valley? South Barna, south of 50. I remember some well fields going in that area. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're crossing. You, you want me to answer yeah. the question? Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, matter of fact, I acquired a thousand lots on behalf of the city for Area 3 Wellfield. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, uh, it's vacant land of 10 or more acres. Why isn't it noted that way? And that shade of red. Yeah, I thought the trail was through that. Yes, it is. Okay. And the GIS it may be divided. I think it's an old plat, so it might be actually separate platted lots. So it didn't show as one consolidated parcel. It's possible. Right. A thousand lots. Yes, sir. It was the uh, Jimmy Hoffa sub subdivision. Yeah. <laughs> it was, seriously. There was always speculation maybe he'd be buried out there. It was, seriously. Was a, seriously. Teamsters <laughs> bought Sun Valley property. Well, you know, he's got jokes. And it couldn't be developed. Uh, Good? Yeah. All right, Mr. Sievers. Uh, staff has a map been furnished to uh, the commission showing the location of the reclaimed water lines in the area of critical concern on the north and its relationship to where the well field, area two well field is located. I believe there may be, but it might be in a different agenda item. No, I don't think so. Well, I asked for a copy of the map and uh, it was produced. I, I can, I don't know whether I have enough copies, but. Uh, I've got uh, it. It was sent to us. Was that Peg. emailed to you? I, I apologize. So okay. Do you, you have? Yes. Okay. What we're looking at. Yeah. North Washington. So. Do you know the volume of the water that uh, is distributed from the north plant uh, into the area of critical concern Sorry. on the uh, north? Yeah. 
I have an email from Water Resources Director Sean Stauffer. The request was, the question was, please advise the average daily flow discharge from the Osprey reclaimed water facility over a six month or yearly period. And the answer was the annual average daily flow rate for 2018 was 2.03 MGD million gallons a day. Is that your answer? Is that the question you're asking? No. <laughs> I, I was more particularly asking how much of, uh, from that north treatment plant, Osprey plant, is distributed on the north area uh, of critical concern. I, I, I got a copy of, he said he didn't know. Okay. They don't meet it. Okay. As you probably know, the only property that receives reclaimed water on, from the area of critical concern on the north is uh, the cemetery. It's the only place of my recollection that receives water. Uh, one question I had is, because of the wording of the staff's report, for council in the event that reclaimed water will not be available to a site so as to address a takings claim. Has the city received a takings claim? No, sir. Why is that in there? I can't answer that question. I believe that there is um, a concern though that uh, the only thing I can say here is that on the in the ordinance where it says um, the current language under, for example, policy 1.14.13 on page 86 of your packet, policy start, currently says all new development located in the area of concern will be required to connect to the reclaimed water system prior to occupancy or provide dry lines for future connection. That's the current language. But the concern here is that it doesn't provide any flexibility or any ability to provide a variance in the event that uh, a connection can't be made for any reason. And so what we're proposing here is the ability for some flexibility for that uh, in the event that that's not, that connection cannot be made. I would like to elaborate on one of Florida statutes that the city attorney and I have recently spent a great deal of time researching and learning a bit about. It is statute 70.45 of Florida statutes, which I plan to provide greater detail on at a future meeting, not necessarily tonight, but I'll give you the read ahead verbally here. Section 70.451C, Florida statutes, defines a prohibited exaction, which is probably the word that should have been used rather than taking in the staff report. This statute section defines a prohibited exaction, that's the key phrase I'm gonna teach you guys about, as any condition that is imposed by a governmental entity, that's us, on a property owner's proposed use of real property that lacks an essential nexus to a legitimate public purpose and is not roughly proportionate to the impacts of the proposed use that the governmental entity seeks to avoid, minimize, or mitigate. So section 70.45 Florida statutes was created specifically to provide landowners with an avenue to pursue an action for monetary damages against a governmental entity that would be suing us for an allegedly unconstitutional or prohibited exaction. So this is what we're seeking to avoid and provide greater flexibility by having language that gives an out. So as I understand your, what you said, then you're saying uh, asking a property owner to install re reclaimed water lines, which I think clearly serves a public purpose, that we can't require that. Unless it's into our plan that we are going to provide that water in th into the reclaimed water lines. Yeah, let me add, so, after, if this so, is, I mean, you yeah. would agree that certainly requiring uh, the installation of water lines, uh, the reclaimed water lines, is a public purpose. Absolutely, we agree okay. with that. We think this serves a public purpose. What we're trying to do is um, come up with some flexibility in the event there are certain <coughs> areas, instances where that can't be achieved. However, 
Just so you understand, with, if this is approved for transmittal, after that, when it comes back to you again, at that time, we want to show you an ordinance that some changes here, if needed, into that Chapter 21 that gives some more guidance to us. And also, uh, we are planning to do develop a, a master plan of reclaimed water and how so to plan out how it can be expanded over time. And that'll give us more guidance. And that certainly provides more legal guidance and defense in the issue in the event when we do ask for connections in the future. Well, my, my question also is we're in the process of reviewing the 2040 uh, draft comprehensive plan. Why isn't that issue a part of that process? We can certainly do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. All right. All right, so we'll open this to the public. Do we have anybody on this signed up? No. All right, so we'll close this to the public and bring it back for the board. What would the commission like to do on this? Vice Chairman Sievers. And certainly, I'm a believer in uh, whatever the city does, it must have a, a proper public purpose and must properly uh, uh, implement its plans. Uh, part of the things that bothers me some is uh, I don't know how long this provision has been in the comprehensive plan, but I gather for some time as to why the city has not been uh, planning ahead and allocating funds for it. Uh, that seems, if you have a comprehensive plan, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to implement the plan and plan ahead. And um, part of my uh, concern also, and this has nothing to do with the applicant <laughs> whatsoever, is the city uh, needs to do its job and its part we have a uh, area two well field as reflected in the uh, report that's a part of the next item that says in essence that uh, the area two well field where we get 50% of our water supply from has problems because the over <laughs> withdrawal of water and the development that has occurred around the area to Wellfield. That's what the report says. And unless reclaimed water lines are installed in this area <clears throat> to, <clears throat> to help supplement uh, the area to Wellfield, we are only shooting ourselves in the foot even more because certainly if, if someone develops a subdivision here, they're going to have individual wells <laughs> and draw water <clears throat> out of the same area that we're drawing water out of. And does that make common sense? I agree we should work with the developer to try to resolve this issue, but my concern is why in the world the city hasn't been looking ahead all along. I, I did secure for a number of years, the city was allocating and budgeting funds for uh, a future project for reclaimed water. Why in 2005, 15, 2016, it has stopped doing that. I don't understand why. And I think the city uh, manager and his staff need to be very upfront as to, since we have a declining well field and we're drawing too much water out of it and we get 50% of our water from that resource, why aren't we trying to protect it? Certainly, it appears on its face based upon the language in the next ordinance that someone drafted, I assume city staff did, 
you make the following findings of fact, whereas the city, excuse me, whereas the Beneful re reuse at least 75% of the wastewater generated by municipal service customer is required by the city's consumptive use permit issued by St. John's, whereas the use of reclaimed water is a valuable resource to be utilized in replenishing local groundwater, especially in the area of critical concern. It does not appear to me, based upon the information that's been supplied, that we are using more than five or 10% at the very most of the North Treatment Plant, which is sized for 2.75 million gallons a day being distributed over on the area to well field area. And I frankly do not understand the reasoning or the logic uh, as such. Um, I mean, if the city needs to, because of a legal standpoint, uh, revisit its policy, then fine. But the city likewise the needs to do the responsible thing and protect its water resource. <laughs> it's just reality. And one of the interesting things to me, and unfortunately right or wrong, I've been involved in in acquiring wells in the area two well fields, acquiring all the wells in the area three well fields, negotiating the contract for supplemental water from the city of Coco, and spent 10 years acquiring the rights in the area four well field. And I've listened to hydrologists and everybody saying, please protect your well field. And we have this valuable resource and one of the interesting things about this, the Area 2 well field, which as the consultant says, produces three million gallons a day, is the cheapest water we produce. And if we're not willing to spend money to protect that resource, does that make sense? Does it really make sense? It's far cheaper to get water, that's what the studies show cheaper to get water from the area two than from area four. Buying it from cocoa was the retail rate. So obviously it's a lot cheaper. And I really question the wisdom why someone would not be planning ahead for protecting area two well field. I mean, uh, staff, I'm not taking it out on you, sir. <laughs> but it's, I have seen what's happened and it's not right. <laughs> I was told that the it's current, not right. <laughs> so I was told the current plan was, uh, there is a master plan that was developed in the mid 90s, but it needs to be updated. And that's what the Water Resources Department intends to do. I'm, far, I, I'm surprised Water Resources are not here defending uh, this request. since this directly affects them and their department. I'm, I'm uh, amazed that they're not here. I'll get off my flat point. Yeah. <laughs> it's contagious tonight, huh? Uh, well, Mr. Richardson, along with this <laughs> map that we got from Peggy, were three budget sheets from different years. I'd ask what is What's the purpose of those three budget sheets? I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Okay. I asked for them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I because I wanted to see how much money the city was allocating for funds for uh, reclaim water lines. It and as, as you will see, they stopped funding it yeah. in 2014. There's nothing on these budget sheets, the most recent budget <laughs> sheets, that they're funding it now. Correct. Okay. And, and the proposed budget for 2019-20, they haven't included any money in that either. All right, is that it? Yes, sir. All right, so we have a, it's been closed to the meeting, or closed to the public, and we need to take action on this, so.
what is commission's desire. I defer. <sighs> Old love. Somebody's got to make a motion here. If I may, there's some information you probably should be aware. I think the answer to Mr. Sievers' question is about um, when this is first implemented. That, that, what I understand is that this was first originally uh, required in the code in 1994. And then there was, um, I believe there's a policy put into the comprehensive plan between. When, when, when that, was that? I don't have the exact date, but what I do have is a date of 2010 when this particular language you see here now was put in the comp plan. So I don't know if it was replaced prior language in the comp plan or, or was new. And so since 2010, I know you had asked us for information about variances. We have records of variances that happened prior to 2010. I think there were two or three examples, and even one of them was withdrawn. But we do not, we couldn't find, at least I couldn't find a, a, a variance that occurred after 2010. Okay. So it seems to us that this policy was very restrictive. And so it just says you, you must connect or not. You must put in dry lines. You don't have an answer. So you can't do anything inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. So I think that's what we're trying to do here is provide that flexibility again and see if there's, a, you know, we only had two rare cases even before them that we could find at least. But there may have been more. So I don't think it's going to be something that's going to happen all the time. Okay. The Certainly. I'm, I'm aware, for example, in Sterling Forest, I think a variance was granted. Then I recall negotiating the agreement whereby they paid part of the cost of extending it, and they did connect. Okay. It all worked out. Yeah. Okay. So, so I need a thumbs up or thumbs down motion on this. So. Or a table or something. Like going back to this, it's like it's this thing on. So, <laughs> Mr. Sievers. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's you. Is so that <laughs> I saw one and then <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> I would uh, move that we recommend to the city council that they uh, transmit uh, with the proviso that uh, within uh, 60 or 90 days we receive a report from the city manager's office indicating their plan as far as um, implementing a plan for installation of reclaimed water lines within the area uh, to Wellfield area. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Can we take a vote on this? Member Spido? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Vice Chairman Sievers? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. Okay. Next item, please. The next item, number 9D, begins on page 99 of your packet. This is an ordinance to amend the city's land development regulations. And on page 99, I'll read the summary here. On May 28, 2019, upon a request by a citizen, the city council approved advisability for staff to review and clarify policy language in the land development regulations, specifically section 30-207, related to the area of critical concern performance standards. The city requested Barnes, Furland, and Associates to provide a desktop analysis and professional opinion regarding the proposed amendment. The conclusion of the report, which is included in your packet here, found in section six, conclusion states in part that EFA concurs with the proposed amendment to the <coughs> Area of Critical Concern, Code Section 30-207, specifically subparagraphs 2C, Retention and Discharge Requirements. On page 101 of your packet is the ordinance. 
if adopted, will amend the city's land development regulations. You'll see on section one of the ordinance, it refers to section 30-207, area of critical concern performance, which is in the land development regulations. Subparagraph A, 2C. And you'll see on page, on the next page, page 102 of your packet, in red, the, the language that's being struck through and the language that's being added. And I'll state, I'll read it here. For development sites having elevations both above and below 25 feet mean, civil, uh, mean sea level, those portions of the site which are above 25 feet in my cell shall conform to the performance in paragraph 2A of this section and all required retention ponds shall be located in the areas above 25 feet MSL post-development. We believe that this will clarify um, some of the, the requirement here. Uh, basically, a new development inside the area of co critical concern is to provide uh, stormwater retention and maintain the elevation even above 25 feet. The clarification as to whether that is pre-development or post-development. A study was, pro or analysis was provided to us um, by Barnes, Furlan and Associates, paid for by the city to determine, to give an opinion to us as to whether this is an acceptable uh, um, amendment to the city's code, whether it have uh, any impacts. That report begins on page 103 of your packet. You will see on page 5, uh, excuse me, I believe that the, the uh, cover page referred to the conclusions, section 6, excuse me. So section six of that report, which begins on page 112 of your packet. The conclusion here, BFA's professional opinion regarding the specific questions asked by the city follow. Assuming that artificially created dry retention ponds are properly positioned and designed, they can be equally effective for recharge protection in cases where the ponds are constructed in areas that in pre-development state are below 25 feet MSL and then are backfilled to 25 feet MSL or above during the construction process as compared to the construction of dry ponds that are constructed in an area that is at or above 25 feet MSL in the pre-development condition. When compared to, with recharge areas under natural conditions, with respect to maintaining recharge, proper de design should include increasing the distance from the retention pond bottom to the water table. Uh, that is currently dealt with right now in another part of our code regarding cut, uh, a maximum cut that you're allowed to do into land on, in, located inside the area of critical concern. Another recommendation, dry retention ponds should be properly positioned and distributed at the Brookshire, and this is in reference to a particular project to allow maximum recharge without a significant loss to evapotranspiration or seepage from the ponds. Therefore, land surface surrounding the retention pond should be relatively flat. So this is also in reference to allowing or recommending it appears that the development should be relatively same elevation or close to in order to allow for a proper uh, stormwater design. And that soils beneath the dry pond bottom should be backfilled with permeable soils, of similar texture and hydraulic characteristics. I believe that's already required. Again, this is a developer asked uh, request and the, app, the city came up with this uh, proposed amendment to the code. Um, I, I just so you know that there, the city right now has a, um, it is our understanding and it's my understanding from speaking with the engineer and with the water resources department that is typically maintaining and designing a 25 MSL is difficult without bringing in fill on a site. Sites in the area of concern with elevations relatively low, 25 or high, uh, 25 MSL are difficult to develop. This new ordinance clarifies how to, prop, how to uh, provide flexibility. According to Barnes, the code change will have a negligible impact on the area of critical concern. However, he suggested additional actions 
which I've just read. But the Water Resources Department has indicated to us and pointed out to us that we already have provisions in other parts of the code that deal with the request, re recommendations. So again, the ordinance is simply to clarify uh, the code requirement. With that, I'll try to answer any questions you have. Vice Chairman Sievers. I, I don't have any uh, questions of staff. Uh, I do have a motion, and um, I don't think this ordinance clarifies uh, things. I think it changes things. And uh, this is advertised for public hearing before the City Council on September 10th, uh, according to the legal ad that was in the newspaper that I saw. We have a regular meeting on September 4th. Uh, this regulation has been in effect since 1986, based upon a study by Dyer Riddle Mills in pre-court. I recall civically drawing up this ordinance at that time. And um, the staff's report is solely based upon the report and recommendation by Barnes uh, Furland and uh, it contains certain analysis, assumptions, et cetera, with regard to the Brookshire subdivision. Uh, I requested on Thursday, August 15th, a rep if a representative from Barnes Furland was going to be available at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to, uh, so that if we had any questions that we could ask some questions. I received a response on August 16th that said, Dwight, there will not be a representative Barnes Furlan at the PNZ meeting, period. I believe it's particularly important that we do our jobs and we do it properly if we're going to change a 30-year requirement. Uh, I myself have uh, not completed my complete review of it, but I have significant uh, questions and concerns. And uh, based upon that, I would respectfully move that we table this item to our next Planning and Zoning Commission meeting on September 4th. Second. All right. Um, <laughs> threw me for a loop on that one. I didn't expect that. Um, Sorry. <laughs> and that's procedurally, that's fine to do it this way without I mean, right from the top. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So we have a motion on the table. Uh, yeah, with a second. Um, so we'll take a vote. Can we get a roll call on this? Vice Chairman Seavers? Yes. Member Spidell? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. I have a follow on motion. I would ask that uh, so move that the Planning and Zoning Commission authorize the Chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission or myself as Vice Chairman to appear before the City Council on August the 27th to ask that a representative from Barnes Furland be made available uh, to, uh, to uh, appear before us so we can uh, properly do our job. I will just note for your information, according to what I receive, uh, Water Resources already spent $3,683.32 for this report, which primarily, uh, is my mind, benefits uh, a private development. And uh, you would think that the city could spend a little money having those individuals appear before the Planning and Zoning Commission to review this item with them. So I would move, make that motion as well. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, uh, take a vote on this. Member Spidell? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Vice Chairman Sievers? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes, and as you've already volunteered to uh, attend, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, 
You're you, first in order. <laughs> you're you're very you know you know this way better than I do. So. <laughs> okay, sir. All right. So all right, let's do this. Uh, I know that we probably have several people in the audience. Um, but if you come up here, we will we will get to you here in a minute for the at the end of the meeting. But um, so if you'd like to come up and speak, as long as it's not pertaining specifically to the item that we just discussed, um, since it hasn't officially been heard. But um, so we'll go with this. Uh, the new development law is that the city reports. I have an item in your agenda tonight that I'd like to teach you all about a new law that's in Florida statutes as of June 28th, 2019. Yep, it starts on page 139. And what I've provided to you is a memorandum that was drafted by the city attorney. He drafted several of them. This is just one as a result of the legislative changes we have this year. And it is a lot of technical stuff, but I'd like to point your attention to the laws of Florida on page 153 of your agenda packet. This memorandum that Richard wrote has six different of the 18 or so different statutes that are affected by this comprehensive law. We call it the growth management catch-all, this law that you've been provided, because there's a lot of different topics that are captured in these 18 or so pages. and. Under section seven of the laws of Florida, I'm sorry, section eight on page 153. It's the beginning of one, end of 152, starts on 153 there. Development permits and orders. That is one of the sections that makes a significant change here that city staff has to amend our process in order to comply with the Florida law. And it's going to have an impact on you all here because it's going to create timelines and date certain that the staff has to respond to applicants. It specifically talks about development permits. Florida statutes does define development permits to include any building permit, zoning permit, plat approval, or rezoning certification variance, or other action having the effect of permitting development as defined by Florida law. So. For any item that's going to obtain a development permit, a permission to develop the land in any of those ways I just mentioned, there's timelines. Within 30 days after receiving an application for approval of a development permit, the municipality must review the application for completeness and issue a letter indicating that all required information is sub submitted, that the applicant has submitted it to the city or specifying with particularity any areas that are deficient. So this means that the staff has to analyze all applications very quickly and there's a quick turnaround. The idea behind this legislation is that it will give applicants a quicker answer rather than having delays in government. And so this will result in the Planning and Zoning Commission having to respond to certain applications within a timely manner. And for certain situations, we have had the opportunity to extend. We're gonna to have to pay attention to ones where we may not have the ability to extend because of a timeline that the city may have to meet in order to comply with the statutory deadlines. Now, I can't give you any examples yet of how this will apply, but I wanted you to understand that this law may affect you in the future. You can read it and you can ask me questions about it, and I'm also going to provide additional memorandums like the one that's attached in your agenda tonight on other topics in the future. I didn't want to give you them all at once. I wanted to give you them one at a time so you could read them, digest them, and ask me questions if you have them. I think this section eight here of this Laws of Florida is particularly important. I also find that on page 156, section 13, and on page 156, section 14, those sections are all significantly um, important for our time frames that the city has to respond to. Due to the late hour of our meeting, I'm not gonna go into any greater detail on what's been provided to you, but I will, like I said, have more informational updates at the end of your upcoming meetings to just let you know what's going on with the Florida legislature. Do you have any questions with the material I've provided? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Richardson. Um, have, has anybody really taken a look at this law 
and assess the cost of it. In other words, if, we, if the staff has a reply <clears throat> in certain guidelines at <clears throat> certain time, would the uh, emphasis is on staff? Can they meet the time limits? I can tell you that that I don't know if there's been a statewide analysis, but for our city, when we met uh, with staff to discuss how we were going to implement the new statutory requirements, for the most part, we are doing things along with the statutory guidelines, and I don't know that it's going to make a significant change in their protocol as far as the review time that we're currently practicing. I just know that this is a requirement we're going to have to pay attention to. Okay. Um, I had a question on uh, affordable housing on page 153. Let me go back to the inclusionary housing ordinance may require a developer to provide a specific number or percentage of affordable housing units. All right, so you follow where I'm going with that? No. All right, it's page 153. This is what we had under. It says an inclusionary housing ordinance may be required may require a developer to provide a specific number or percentage of affordable housing units to include it in a development or allow a developer to contribute to a housing fund or other alternatives in lieu of the building, uh, the affordable housing units. However, in exchange, the municipality must provide incentives to fully offset all costs to the developer of its affordable housing contribution, such as incentives may include, and then it goes into bonuses for, you know, bonus credits uh, for density, reducing or waiving fees, granting other incentives, which is vague. Anyway, this is what I saw underlined as a new, something new, that's how I interpreted that, right? And yes. uh, wow, that is huge. That's why we call it the growth management catch-all. Well, I mean, it's, it's a bit uh, infuriating, I think, that uh, it's kind of the unfunded mandate. Say, hey, this is what we want, and now you got to pay for mm -hmm. it. You know, um, whether it be the developer or the city, um, because yeah. I mean, I guess you know, on one hand, you could say, okay, we'll give you a cut on, we'll give you a five percent break on your, I don't know, but uh, I mean, maybe there could be some bonus credits for this. But I mean, if it's, let's put it this way, how are we going to determine how we're going to or I should say the city is going to fully reimburse them. You follow me? I mean, what's, what's the, um, how are you determining what's fair? I mean, am I, am I off base on this? What this is saying is that if you do require or adopt an inclusionary zoning, that you'd have to provide these kind of incentives and returns to a developer. Right. So we currently, we don't have an inclusionary You're zoning. You're saying that right now. it's optionary. It's right. Option. This, this, right. If you look at subsection right. one, which currently right. exists. I was taking it as, uh, because it says may, and then I'm like, you know, I'm thinking it's telling us we're going to have to do this. And as if we adopt that option, right? Some cities have that inclusionary requirement. Really? So they do. Wow. Now they have to abide by this. Yeah. Well, I mean, who would do that? I mean, that's. Uh, <laughs> I don't understand how that, okay. Okay. So is that it? Yeah, that concludes my report. All right, thank you. <laughs> Colonel Lapp and I, I did misinterpret that because it's, uh, I was thinking it was something we had to do. And so yeah, as you, as you stated, all of the underlined language is new and what is not underlined is currently existing in the statutes. And if you do want to discuss any of this offline or after the meeting, I'd be happy to set up a time for you to come in and meet with me on any of it. Okay, and then we got the City Council Summary of Actions, which I think we've all read. Um, is there anything else you'd like to report uh, from City staff? No reports. Well, yeah, no, I haven't forgotten. I'm just I'm going following my um, my agenda here, and see, it's it's I'm still in order. I mean, it's uh, that's the next item. So, and then some petitions and requests from public present. 
Seeing we have no uh, nobody here anymore, so we are adjourned. No, 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 no. Oh, oh sorry, no, we're not adjourned. No. So I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> Like Two I'm, things. The first thing, I would like to grant Member Hare an excused absence for tonight. So moved. Okay. Um, so all in favor? Well, I mean, uh, well, here's how long how many has she been absent for? Two? This the second one? Yeah. All right, so... I mean, yes, we can absolutely do that, but also what, what should happen too is she should put in a request or, or re if you could reach out to her and ask her if that's acceptable to, um, she did tell me she was going to be back in September. Yeah. Um, but uh, she may want to. I'll give her a call and make sure there's no need to take any council action. Yeah. So, so to continue that, we had a, a motion, so just say all in favor, say aye. 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 I'll oppose. It so and we would request that the council would consider excusing this. And my second question is, it came up before city council or TEC. They asked, the TEC asked us to send a representative to serve on TEC, a non-voting TEC member from PNZ. And given that we have a lack of P and Z people showing up at the meeting, you know, and I hope we're keeping track of the misses this year. We've got a TEC member that would like to sit on P and Z. I guess he would be non-voting. Understand that the ordinance allows us to designate a PNZ member to be a non-voting meeting to CEC. Is that true? Well, we, we had submitted that request for you guys to look at that in previous uh, actions. And I don't think we've heard back on that. I believe the council has this on their next agenda, a discussion about this, or was it the last one? There's a staff member who has a report to council, I think. I don't know if it's on the calendar or not, but I could pull up the code. I believe that the member is a voting member of this commission. That's true, yes. Not a non-voting member. The only right. non-voting member of the Planning and Zoning Commission would be the non-voting school board member, unless the code was changed, in which case the school board member could be a voting member. Okay, but clarify that a bit. Are we talking about a P and Z member appointed to TEC or TEC member appointed to PNZ? One moment, please. So didn't we discuss? I was asked this question while having lunch with one of the council members. I thought you were even talking about. Yeah. I'd say it, but. Okay. I thought we were waiting to hear back. But the, he must be looking it up. <laughs> yeah, so in here it is, Chelsea. It's in 31 122 the A of the code. At least one member of the commission shall currently be, a, okay. The Titusville Environmental Commission may designate a member to serve as an alternate to the Titusville Environmental Commission member, I'm sorry. At least oh, yeah, one of the members of the Titusville Environmental Commission shall be, currently be a member of the City of Titusville Planning and Zoning Commission. The TEC may designate a member to serve as an alternate to the TEC member that is the current member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. So the person yeah. who is serving the dual role could be an alternate to the TEC, but whoever serves the dual role shall be a regular member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Okay, that and was so my question. Of your regular membership, who wants to be either a regular alternate member of the TEC is the way that the code is currently written. But there is always room for the council to amend the way the code is written so that it could have a different 
framework. Okay. And I think that's why it's going to council, so they can look at that and decide if they want to change it or keep it as is. Okay. Um, my next point is given that we have workshops uh, for the 2040 comprehensive plan, I think it's incumbent that we have as many active members of PNZ at meetings. What was that? I think it's incumbent on us to have as many members at PNZ meetings because we're we're de dealing with workshop on the 2040 comprehensive plan. They <clears throat> need to be here. I will add that your alternate member, um, Taylor, Taylor, is submitting a request for a leave of absence due to personal reasons until November 13th for this board. She's your alternate member, so her attendance requirements are slightly different. They are more stringent for the regular members because alternate members are asked to appear in the event that a regular member is absent from the meeting. There are seven regular positions and two alternate positions and a vacancy in the non-voting school, school board member okay. position. As I recall, at every code enforcement meeting, uh, an attendance list was passed out that covered the last six months. Who was there, who was absent? But I haven't seen that on PNZ yet. We have that record. We just haven't passed it out. I believe it was asked for at the code enforcement meeting specifically. I think that's why it was passed out. We do have that information available and we provide it to council when they request it because they are the ones who appoint the members and they do take into consideration the attendance record of the members. Well, if it's gonna be reported to council, just as in the case of the code enforcement, I would request that it be passed out to us at every meeting. We can certainly yeah, do that. that. Y'all object? I mean, I get it when somebody's on the naughty list. I mean, but uh, no and, yeah, it's, I don't think it's that big of a deal. But you're saying every meeting? Every meeting. Well, well was that once achieved? a month. Okay. Once a month. Um, okay. I mean, yeah, if that's what you want. I mean, that's. I don't. I mean, even if you could email it out to us, would that be safe? It paper? doesn't matter. Yeah. Everybody has emails, right? Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. So, what? What would you, uh, yeah, hey, I apologize for skipping. I'm like, I wanted to get out of here, I guess, but I didn't even. Um, so is it fine? I mean, do we have to take action? Is that what you would like, or do we have to we take a vote? We hear you. Okay. Um, Member Spidell. Yes, sir. Well, is there anything you would like to yeah. say, report? Fabulous evening. Okay. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Vice Chairman. Uh, I have two items I'd like to mention. Uh, I had planned on bringing them up uh, on the July 17th meeting. Unfortunately, I wasn't here. Uh, one of the items I would like to uh, say, I was a little delayed on the Riverwalk uh, project. I was happy to see uh, that finally uh, an applicant came forward that utilized all the land. They didn't have those two little outcroppings called future development that uh, created problems for this board. Uh, that is the way it should have been taken care of from the very beginning, rather than creating a, a controversy. And uh, I, uh, I'm glad to see that was finally resolved. The second item is, and I'll, I'll pass down uh, a copy of a development order that was entered. And if they, okay. This was the one on new life. <laughs> and um, you may recall, this was approved by uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission 
on June the 5th, we, there were three conditions as outlined by staff, plus a fourth condition that we recommended that said condition to limit the student capacity to the number allowed by the existing facility. The application itself showing that we're going to use the existing facility. My concern is, and, and, and of course, um, not Brad, <laughs> But, but uh, it was recommended they don't need the condition we impose or recommended. Five years from now, ten years from now, when New Life decides, oh, we want to build a standalone building out here, and they look, oh, they have a development order, and they have a conditional use to allow a, a private school. There's no site plan attached that would uh, limit anything. There's no limitations uh, stated. For example, the limit we stated, and I frankly do not understand why there is a resistance on staff's part to include certain provisions that are suggested to protect staff and protect the city. All that condition was was to do exactly what was requested and it was based upon existing facility and I just do not understand because I have seen this happen in the past. They look back some future planner or future uh, building official, oh, they already have a, a CUP for a private school for this property. They don't need to do anything else. And. Believe it or not, sometimes we as a planning and zoning commission are trying to help and protect the city. And I just don't understand why there is a resistance not to accept some of our recommendations as such. The staff I'm saying the same thing you, you say many times, mm -hmm. sir. You're gonna say you're wasting your time? <laughs> no, um, all right, Member Baker, Was, is that it? Yes, sir. All right, Member Baker. All right, and I have nothing, so. Um, I did want to say thank you to Brad for uh, looking into that, um, the flags. I wasn't actually asking them for to be removed. I was asking them to be moved upright, but uh, so that uh, they weren't blocking the street, but I appreciate you looking into that. And uh, But even so, I don't know if somebody said something to them, but they moved them up so that you can now see the traffic. So I thank you, and uh, we're adjourned.